All right, everyone. Welcome to another episode of David's Saturday Night Sit Back. Tonight, I have on Austin's best barber, Philip Winfrey. How's it going, everybody? Um, Philip is out here normally chopping mops. His favorite style is to for you just to show up and say, do whatever you want. He promises that he's going to make you look good, but it's not another day in, in paradise, Phil. Man, you got all my... All my sayings down. I do. You only got to sit in the shop for one day to hear to figure it out. <laughs> and then the only other one that I, I liked, uh, well, I liked a lot of the things that you said in your post, but there is one where you said you give a, you give good haircuts while telling bad jokes. So I expect a minimum of three bad jokes before oh, this episode man. is over. <laughs> no, no pressure, but you're going to okay. have to come up with some. Uh, okay. Well, it's going pretty naturally to me, so okay. it shouldn't be a problem. Cool. How's your day going so far? It's good. Just another busy day. Everybody's busy at the shop. Uh, about quick. You got 148 days until. Do you know what's in 100? Getting married, days? I think. It's, <laughs> it's, <laughs> I was just gonna say. You better know <laughs> this one. Yep, that's it. Uh, are you excited? Nervous? Sounds about right. Is it all all the feelings? How how do you feel about that? I'm just excited for now. I think the nerves will probably hit me as it gets close. You know, getting close to the day. Um, I know it's gonna go well. We were, I was just on the phone with Sabrina before this, uh, talking about DJ stuff. So we're wrapping up some of the finer details, planning. And then uh, I guess we just coast in. I don't know. I don't really know what to expect. Just taking it one day at a time. Off the top of your head, do you know how many people are showing up? Give or t- give roughly? Uh, 125. Ooh, that's a big wedding. Should be pretty good. Yeah, mostly yeah. friends, family. A little bit of both. A little bit of both. Good. Yeah, yeah we're doing it up. Northern Illinois, where we're from. So uh, we got a good amount of friends and family up there, both of us, and a couple people from Texas coming out too. How long you been in Austin for? Um, I've lived here three separate times, but this time around, um, seven years. Sweet. Why yeah. Austin? How did you decide to, to come out this way? Uh, my older sister moved out here first. She, she uh, got married out here and uh, moved out here. We'd come visit. And um, I always loved it, but really uh, it was because my parents got split up and, and uh, my mom moved out here with me and my siblings. And uh, that was the first time I moved out here. And they all kind of stayed and I ended up moving back to Illinois, moved back here again, moved back to Illinois, and then this is the third time around. But they've all been here, so I guess to be closer to family and uh, it's a much better place for a barber. Okay. Not a lot of great barbers out here, but... There's a lot of people that care about their appearance, so it's been a good, it's been good to me. How do you find out this knowledge that Austin, that's so specific that there's not a lot of great barbers, but there are that, a lot of people who care about the hair, the beard? Um, that's something I kind of just figured out after I moved here. Not necessarily the reason I moved here, but I figured it out after I moved here that that is the case. So you got um, a mix of like luck and timing. Worked out, yeah. Yeah, it worked out. It worked out really well. Yeah, yeah, Austin's a good-looking city, you know, like um, a lot of people that care about their health, their physical well-being, and their image, whether it's because of what they do or that's just their personality. Um, it really is. So being somebody that can help people get that image that they want, it could be lucrative. One thing I have noticed, and this isn't like a knock on my hometown or anything, but my gym is filled with teenagers, mm. and these kids are are big and they're strong and i was i've been curious that's is that an austin thing was it a sacramento thing that teenagers were just too busy when i was a teenager i was did some sports played a lot of video games i couldn't give a rat's ass about the gym and some of these kids they're so big i don't take them as 16 year olds you know i'll be in conversation with one of them talking about technique and then he'll mention school and I'll say, oh, where do you go to college? And he's like, oh, no, I go to the high school down the street. I'm like, a second, you're 200 pounds. How yeah. old are you? And he's like, I'm 16. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I've, I've noticed that too. Like kids are getting big. And I think that is a, I think that social media is a big driver in that. And, and that they're being exposed to, I don't know, fitness uh, pages and whatnot. And they're kind of like aspiring to be that way more so. When I was a kid, I didn't look up to anybody. I mean, I guess I liked athletes, but I wasn't following fitness pages, right? things like that. That just wasn't around. So 
I feel like these kids are looking up to that. And then being in Austin, like I said, it's just a city where a lot of people are in shape and good looking. So the kids see that and, and they want to live up to it. So I say, I say good on them for getting started early. I mean, I wish I would have taken lifting more seriously as a kid. I, I do too, because I think that I probably would be in overall better shape if I had started younger, because it'd be so easy to, it's easier to fix something that's not broken than to fix something that is. <laughs> that makes any, you know what I'm saying? Well, like if you start working out when you're 30, maybe your elbows are starting to ache or your knees are starting to hurt or you already have a gut or whatever the thing is, right? But if you start out when you're very, very young and you're, you haven't had enough time to damage your body through either injuries, drinking drugs, whatever the, the thing is, you know, like you're in the prime condition to just... 100%. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm fighting that right now with stretching, especially my, like my hamstrings, so tight that... And I never took that seriously as a kid, never stretched. Wish I would have. Now I'm fighting it, you know. I'm on the wrong end of it. And, yeah. Are your hamstrings tight because you're standing all day? or I just think they've always been that way. I remember even as a kid in, like, gym class, you do the you do the test days, right, and push-up test. I'm, I was great. The pacer where you're running back and forth, no problem. But the one where you sit and reach, I think that's what it's called, the sit and reach, I couldn't even hit the first bar. Like, I just never had flexibility. I, don't, I think it's probably because I played sports like every day, all day growing up, whether it's at the park or for a team. Never once stretched, never warmed up, never cooled down. We just went right into it. Hell yeah. <laughs> That's the man no, thing to do. I guess don't so. stretch. Just, I guess just so. go. <laughs> but uh, I mean, like to me, I got to blame, like, I guess my dad and like my coaches for not emphasizing that as a kid. Like, I just, you know, nobody I really looked up to was doing that kind of stuff. So uh, I just didn't pick it up. Yeah. Yeah. Here's a, a quick testament to stretching because I'm not a stretcher either. I had a sore foot for a while, and at first it was from a it, it flared up when I was at an all day music festival, and so I ignored it for a couple of months. And then after it'd been a couple months, I was out with some friends, and I mentioned it to them, and they were like, "It's still hurting." That was back in September. Like, go get it scanned. It's probably broken. You can get a boot on it, wear the boot for two weeks, pain's gone forever, you're back to normal. Turns out they did a scan, nothing was fractured. They told me something that was even worse, which was you have plantar fasciitis. So have you heard of that? Yeah, a Bulls player that uh, I really liked growing up was always fighting his whole career. And like, it seemed like it was one of those things that just once you have it, you might always kind of be fighting it. So get this, and my maybe mine was a mild case, I'm not sure, but I went to one doctor and she wanted to prescribe me a prescription, couldn't tell you which one. Um, I went to H-E-B, I got it, it's on my counter, I took a couple pills, threw the rest out. Went to a different doctor hoping he could refer me to like a physical therapist or something. He prescribed me a stronger pill. He was like, try taking this back, she'd take it for two weeks and then come back and we'll reassess. I never even picked that one up. I've never been, even like when I'm hungover, I'm that kind of person that for whatever reason, I won't even take ibuprofen. I, I don't, don't ask me why. I just- Hey, I can relate. I just don't, for whatever reason, I'd rather hydrate and power through. So I got someone else's opinion and he said, stretch, he gave me a list of stretches and said, do these stretches for a minimum of 30 seconds, both your legs, even the one that doesn't hurt and do it three times a day. And I've been doing that now for about 30 days and the pain is going down to a point where like today, I barely noticed it. So I went from like whatever October through February 1st was and like like getting out of bed limping. And now I'm walking almost pain-free and all I did was 10-ish minutes of stretching throughout the day. So, so what's the stretch? I feel like you gotta share. <laughs> so one is just when you, like when you just, they're all calf stretches. So one is just doing this. And then usually I'll lean on the couch and lean this leg forward. Uh, the other one is to find a stair or even a wall and put your foot up against it and lean your hip in as close as you can get. Oh yeah. And then the third one is you grab a towel and you're sitting down back up against a wall. Ideally, you throw the towel over your foot and then you just pull. And so I just hold these three movements for about a minute each, three times a day. That's it. And that's what I was looking for. I wasn't looking for two different doctors to prescribe me a pill. I was looking for someone to be like, 
go do this thing. And I'm really glad I found that person. But um, that's that's medical care in America right now. Is we'll give you a pill for it. It's hard to find the guy that's going to give you a legitimate, useful um, a treatment rather than a, a pill. Yeah. But yeah, I, I can I can definitely relate to that. I mean, I've had had like back problems. Um, went to chiropractors, went to a doctor that gave me uh, muscle relaxers, and like you said, I took like one, and I was like, I'm not, I'm not doing this. Like, I don't want to go down this path, right? And over time, eventually, I, I can't remember who told me these stretches. I think it actually might have been a chiropractor there. Um, just started doing these back stretches every day, and have not had that back pain since. Recently, got some groin pain, so I got to figure out some new stretches for that. Groin? Yeah. Ow. Started a flag football league and um, my body wasn't ready for it. <laughs> so, so um, I've been fighting that. I remember last summer I went to my brother's place in Salem, Oregon, and I played basketball with my three nephews. And we only played for about forty-five minutes, but I didn't play ball in over a decade. And we were playing on cement, you know. So my old ass legs. The next morning I wake up. And I go to get out of my bed and my shin splints were on fire. Mm. They were so bad. Oh, yeah. like, <laughs> that was one of those moments in my mid thirties where I was like, oh fuck. Yeah. I really am aging. <laughs> like <laughs> this, I played basketball for forty minutes and now I'm begging my brother to walk my dog. This is terrible. <laughs> um, yeah, I play I love basketball. I play a couple of times a week and that's where I was getting a lot of my back pain from. And um and that's when I started doing stretches. I do it before I play, try to do it after I play as well, have any problems. But I feel like football, uh, I don't know, it's just you're using different muscles or cutting hard or whatever. That kind of hit the groin. So, like I said, now i got to figure out what I'm going to do for that. But uh, I'm going to solve it with stretching. I think that I really think that's the that's the uh, answer when you get these strains, these muscle problems and aches, like stretch them, find the right stretches. How, uh, how old are you? 29. 29. You're too young for all this, man. But at the same time, it is what it is. Whether you're 24, 34, 44, like. I've been stretching all growing up, you know, so I feel like now it's really, really hitting me. And um, I want to be able to keep playing these sports for at least another 10 years. So I'm really trying to take this seriously now, even though guys give me shit. You know, I pull up early and I'm stretching. They're like, man, you're too young to be stretching. Like, I want to keep playing when I'm older. So it is what it is. No one's too young to be stretching. That's what I say, but there's like this uh, sort of stigma about it. I guess, or stigma, or we're, we're just, I guess what I was saying earlier, a lot of people don't really push it, you know, in, in terms of like push stretching on people, hey, telling kids, you gotta stretch, you gotta do uh, yeah, you just don't see a lot of people doing it. We had a uh, personal trainer on a few episodes ago that does a lot of uh, training with high school athletes. And even he said that his sometimes, I hope I don't misquote him, but he essentially said, that sometimes his biggest problem is like getting the parents buy-in because you'll have the dad who wants the kid to be doing, you know, heavy squat, heavy bench press. But if you're playing football, especially depending on the position or soccer or basketball, whatever the sport is, is having a extremely heavy bench press actually doing anything for you? And so I think you're right that there is a stigma that guys should be doing these lifts, girls should be doing these lifts. For me, one of my favorite days of the week is leg day and I'll do any workout. So I do all the, the girl workouts and I'll be doing like the adductors, the abductors, the glute bridges where you put the bar on your waist, lean up against a bench and, you know, do the thrust. Um, and some of my buddies and they're not being malicious. They're just, they're just poking fun because that's what your guy friends do. But they'll just be like, what the fuck are you doing, man? I'm like, yeah, my legs are bigger than yours and I'm yeah. stronger than you. So where did that come from though? <laughs> but cause I, I totally agree even in high school, I remember like the workouts they gave us for every sport, it was squats, deadlifts, bench. And so, and these days when I go to the gym or at least for a long time, that's what I was doing. Cause that's all I knew. And just recently I had a client who's a power lifter work with me, give me a little routine. There's no bench, there's no squat, there's no deadlift. And yet my legs were burning and I feel strong, I feel good. And it was some of those like hamstring curls and, and just other things that I wasn't doing. But doing them correctly, which meant going down a lot on my weight, which, you know, it's like the opposite of what you want to do when you go in the gym, I feel like, or at least mentally. Yeah. You know, your ego kicks in, you want to do heavy. But um, 
guys, I think that's just common. Um, really common in the gym to see guys lifting too heavy, not stretching, doing the wrong exercises. I don't know why that is. Why there's so much like misinformation or misguided uh, etiquette out there. I think it'd be more common with, with how easy information is to get these days. Could be that a lot of the fitness pages they're following could be could be inaccurate because that's who the person they're looking up to is doing. I don't know. I can't speak for all that's fitness people. That's true. a very, very broad generalization. But sure, um, uh, it's probably true. I'd say the same for like barber pages. I see these guys that like they want to be influencers, and so and 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 they say things like they're fact. Maybe it did work for them but that doesn't mean that's what you should be pushing on every single barber to do. And the same thing for fitness pages. Maybe you're big and um, maybe you got strong this way, but that doesn't mean everybody that. So I don't know. I think maybe you just need to include that in your page. Like, hey, this is how I do it. doesn't mean it's how you need to do it. Yeah. Sort of a level of, um, I guess, honesty with that, that. My way isn't the only way. I do know when I think back when I was in high school, and this partly could be because I had a hard time making friends, but a lot of my decisions too were based on like, what's gonna make me look cool? Like, I'll openly admit that. So I wonder how much of that is into it as well, like of just, well, all the other guys or, or even for ladies, you know, anyone, anyone, like this is what everyone is doing. So this is how I'm gonna dress. This is how I'm gonna lift. And peer pressure was huge as a kid, you know, even now, every now and then I'll see myself succumbing to it. I'm grateful to say like, it's definitely significantly less now than when I was a teenager, but you do every now and then I'll do, I'll have that thought of like, what will Phil think about me if I say this or do this on the podcast or whatever the thing is. And I think actually, let me reframe it this way. The thoughts are still there. I just don't act on them as much anymore. I've learned to realize that I need to do what is either best for my health or I'm going to start the podcast regardless of if someone thinks it's a terrible idea or what, whatever it is, you know, I just try those thoughts have a significantly less influence in my life now. Yeah. Yeah. You're on your own path, you know, and the same thing when, when I'm in the gym, I remind myself of that all the time. Cause I'm the same way. Like I know that guy's doing two plates over there, but I'm on my own path right now. This is where I'm at. Yeah. You got to be honest with yourself. This is where I'm at. There's no, you can't lie to yourself in the gym. You know what I mean? That's, that's kind of a, the beauty of it. You are where you are, and there's no there's no cheating. It. You could put more weight on, but you're going to sacrifice for them, and you're going to hurt yourself. You're not going to get stronger, so you just got to be honest with yourself about it. But you're right. Like, you're, you see your buddy doing, you're, especially when you're a kid, your buddy's doing plates. You can't go take that weight off and put 25s on. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. That's, the, <laughs> that's how, at least that's where my head was at. It's like, no, I'm, I got to do the same weight as him. Otherwise, he's going to think I'm weak. Yeah. There's this one buddy who... Uh, uh, his name's Jesse. He lives back home in Sacramento and we worked out together quite often. And he was one of my favorite people to work out with because we were almost equal strength on everything. And so in that case, I always push myself a little bit harder with him with him because if he was doing 40 pound curls, you know, I'm like, I know I can do those too because we're just about equal. So I do think that makes the best workout partner is if you happen to be able to find someone with similar strength, if you like even working out with people, some people I know to prefer to work out alone, but I just always knew like I, like it, working out with him, I would push myself a, a little bit more because I knew like I was holding myself back. Yeah. I think I found as I've gotten older, I, I prefer to work out alone. As a kid, I definitely would work out with my buddies in a group. You definitely see that in the gym, like the teenagers are always working out in groups, right? Yeah. Like three, four, five of them, and they'll take up Ten. a machine for a fucking hour. But <laughs> now these days, I like the mental sort of exercise of pushing myself, being honest with myself, like you said, and, and you know, just taking that time for myself. And I'll sort of reflect on life, whatever. I mean, it's a good time to yourself there. Speaking of teenagers, you graduated high school, and then what did sort of life look like between after that you know did you ever did you ever go to college and i'm sort of curious like how you got into your profession um yeah so like i never technically like well i guess i graduated high school but like the day of my last classes i was ready to go i had a long distance girlfriend for the full like 10 months that i lived in austin for the first time it was my senior year and i shouldn't have done that but i also had all my friends back in illinois that i grew up with my whole life and my dad was back there um, and so I was kind of one foot out the door the whole time I was in Texas. So the day of my last class, finished up, hopped in my car, it was already packed up, said my goodbyes and 
it back to Illinois. I never like walked the stage or anything for high school. And um, I moved back, and that was pretty like short sighted. I just knew I wanted to get back. And I started. Uh, I didn't have a vision of barbering at that point. I didn't know what the hell I wanted to do. I went to the community college up there, College of Lake County. It's actually pretty solid community college. It's good for me, even though I never, while I was going to school, I never, nothing clicked for me. Like, I never was like, yeah, this is what I want to do. It's, a lot of times it actually was like pulling teeth just to get myself to go because I didn't enjoy it, but um, I wanted to finish it because, you know, I started it. And, um, I guess I'm trying to think back on what this timeline looked like because I guess I was I was sort of like getting close to my associates in community school and I had the idea of doing barber school and I found one in my I think my, my older sister she's she's really been more like a mentor to me than anybody she's nine years older super successful and she sort of was pushing me to find the path and, and um, help me to find a barber school here in Austin and I signed up for it I was like emailing with them and stuff and then finally moved back out to Austin at that point and I go to it's called Roffler it actually just got bought out and it's, it's like one of the oldest the oldest school in Austin put out a lot of good barbers one of the barbers at my shop is from there um, but I show up for like my first day to meet him and he tells me there's a year and a half wait which never mentioned over the emails and I was that would have been nice to know <laughs> and that, that was a big that was a big letdown and 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 uh I remember being really upset about that, and I was like, I'm not, I'm not doing that. Uh, I'm, I'm not waiting a year and a half. And I was able to find a school in Illinois. And I will say, I was also, I was also sort of hesitant about moving back out here again because I still had that same long distance girlfriend who's, um, we had, we broke up after. I'll get to that in a second. We, I was, I was already kind of one foot out, hesitant. And then once I found I was a year and a half to get into barber school, I was like, no, fuck this. I'm going back to Illinois. I paid off this car that my sister helped me to buy. It was like a few grand. I just worked 60 hours a week for like three months, saved every cent, paid it back to my sister, and then drove that thing back to Illinois after three months. And I was able to get into this barber school in Illinois right away. And um, again, short-sighted. Didn't do any research on a school. Hmm. Terrible fucking school. Sh shut down shortly after I went there. I want to say only one other barber got their license in like the two years I was there. And um, had a lot of really bad experiences at that school that, I can look back on and say that uh, I grew from and they were good for me, but at the time, like, I couldn't believe that's like, that was a legitimate school. Um, but even even so, when I first started barber school, I wasn't sold that it was one I wanted to do long term. I just kind of was like, you know what, I, I can kind of see myself doing this and at least I can make money doing this while I figure out what else I'm gonna do. And it was only over, uh, over a lot of trial and error and some soul searching that I decided to commit to it and became passionate about it over time. And um, after I graduated barber school there, I, I eventually moved back out here. That was kind of the general, general journey. You mentioned, mentioned some trial and error. Was there a, a one or two cuts in particular that were uh... Definitely, Awful. <laughs> definitely one that stands out. Was this the one? Did we talk about this. Yeah, I think I. I think we did. Obviously, we were run on mic though. But if it, yeah, tell me, great... tell say it, tell us again. I love the story because <laughs> because well, I guess the ending of it is the cherry on top. But yeah, yep. so it was like my first my first Saturday on the floor is what they call it, and that's where like you really cut in hair. They run it like a barber shop, and it was, it was in, we're in a mall, and uh, the mall's busiest on Saturday, so that's when we got the most walking traffic, and it was just. It was just, you're just cutting hair. And people walk up and you say, yeah, I got you next. And so just kind of run like a barbershop. So it gets you some real life experience. And um, I was not ready for it. But the school required it of you. And like I said, the school was terrible. I, I got so many examples, but they they didn't care, I guess, that I wasn't ready. Maybe that's a good thing. Like, hey, you, you just got to do this. Because end of the day, that's kind of how cutting hair is. Like, you got to be willing to get in there and do it eventually. So, um, yeah, I get this this Navy girl. There's this Navy base, Great Lakes Navy base, right down the way from uh, the mall, Gurney Mills, pretty um, pretty big mall. But they come in and get their cuts, and she had um, longer straight hair. More, like, I guess, like a pixie cut would be 
general term. More of scissor work all over. I didn't know what the hell I was doing. Never done anything like that. Everything I'd done to that point was like all clippers. I didn't even know how to use my shears and comb like that. And um, the in instructor, I guess, that was there at the time, he wasn't an instructor. He didn't have a license, but he owned the school. And uh, he would kind of pretend to be a barber sometimes. He didn't know how, what the hell he was doing either, so he was no help. I called him over one, at one point during that cut, and he, he, he was no help. And I was kind of left to my own devices. And eventually got to the point where I told her, like, I'm sorry, like, this is the best I could do. And she was super cool about it and didn't blow up on me. I had a lot of people blow up on me at that school for a lot less. And she was super cool about it. Obviously, didn't charge her for the cut. I felt really bad about it. I, like, I mean, of course, right? Like, I messed her hair up. And I was upset. And but after uh, after school that day, I went to do my uh, go to work, which was also in that mall at the Ruby Tuesday. And I was a host at the time. I had just started. And sure enough, like 30 minutes into my shift, she comes in with a group of friends and I've got to like greet them and sit them at their table. And she had a hat on. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, again, she was cool. We didn't even, I didn't even, like we didn't make eye contact. We just pretended you like- make eye contact? Pretended like it. We just pretended like it never happened, I guess. Like that's that's what I remember. It's just like, hey, how's it going? And they're like, hey. And I was like, well, five of y'all, yep, okay, okay. Did y'all right over here? And I never walked back over by that <laughs> section. Like, and she never came back to school. <laughs> Yeah, there is. <laughs> that's but funny. That's really the only haircut I can look back on and say, yeah, I really messed that up. Um, like I could look back on any haircut I've ever done and say I could have done this better, that better, but um, that's the only one where I really feel like I messed up, and I just wasn't ready for that cut. So I don't, I don't hold that against myself looking back on it. Right. This is what it is. You were there. She was there. It's just the wrong. That was part of the journey. It wasn't being kind <laughs> to either of you that day. That's right. But, um, yeah, no, that's awesome. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Looking back on it, you know, now that you're seven years into it, um, let's say you had the opportunity to talk to like an 18 year old in, in a coffee shop and this senior is, is torn, you know, they're like, well, all my friends are going to school, like going back to that again, like this is what everyone else is doing. You know, maybe I want to start a business, but I have no idea what I'm passionate about or you know, maybe I want to join the military and they're just thinking of like, what direction should I go? I just feel like college isn't the thing for me or or maybe they're fine with going to college, but they just have no idea what they want to do. Like, should I be a business major? Should I be medical? So now that you're 29 and you found a job that you're in love with, what, you know, if you had five minutes to talk to someone in that situation, what do you think you would tell them? Go to community school, 100% is what I say. If you really have no idea of, this is what I want to focus in on. Like, go spend a thousand dollars or get a grant and go for free to community college for a year, two years. Get your associates and like, give yourself some time to figure it out. Be around other people that are figuring it out. Um, I, I think that's what everybody should do. Honestly, I mean, some people are like, they know in high school what they're going to do, which I'm envious of those people. I, I think that's impressive when people really have it figured out at that young of an age. But I think most people don't. And a lot of people go to four-year school and waste a lot of time and money trying to commit to something they're not ready to commit to. I had a lot of friends go down that path. I'm sure you know people that have gone down the path. Like mm -hmm. everybody knows people that have gone down the path. They party and, you know, and like I said, they're not really invested and you end up getting a degree in something that you don't even end up working in. And right. I'm not saying you can't be successful on that path, but I think you're just making it harder on yourself. And you want to party and have the college experience like you can do that still when you go to community college like you still right. have a good time i think there's something to be said too for and if you disagree with this please like push back i, I i'd love to hear but i sometimes think like you you have to jump through some hoops and eventually you will find what you're passionate about and what what i mean by that let me make it more concrete is in my life experience all everyone was going to college. So for no reason except for that, I said, fuck that, I'm not gonna go. Four years later, I ended up going. <laughs> I went to school, got my degree in accounting, did accounting for two and a half years, hated it. I was bored out of my mind. And so I left the industry to become a recruiter. Fast forward another four years, I'm now starting this podcast. And like we talked about before we started recording, it would make I feel like I'd be living a dream if 18 months from now I was giving my boss a two weeks notice. 
but I also don't think I should have started this podcast any earlier. I think in my 20s, I was too immature. I think I was playing a victim. I think that I needed to figure out a lot of things about myself. And if I'd started this a couple years ago, I would be using this platform to sort of say, woe is me and to get attention and to try to get people to feel bad for me. So I feel like life sort of helped get me to my destination in the time it should. And so I like your advice that if you really don't know what you should do, you know, maybe just just stay busy and make sure you're doing something. Don't stay stagnant, you know, <laughs> but do do something and, and figure it out. And eventually life will work itself out and you'll find you'll find that job that makes you smile. Yeah, I, I 100% believe that life will work itself out. You could those things you just said about why you started it now and why you shouldn't have started early. Like you could not have known that at the time when you were in your 20s, right? Like you wouldn't have had that sort of self-awareness and ability to reflect and look back. You, you only get that with time and you can only think that way about your past. So it's sort of hard to explain all that to a young kid, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> because 10 years ago to them, they were 10 years old. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, so, but I love that you just said, oh, because all my buddies are going to college, that's why I'm not going. Because that's sort of the contrarian, like, everyone else is zigging, I'm going to zag. And I tend to think that's the way to go through life. Um, but for the most part, I, I really agree with what you said. Like, life is going to work itself out. Do things when you're ready. They might not all go how you expected. They probably won't, really. But um, life will definitely take you to where you're supposed to be. As long as you, I think you just it's important to uh, do everything with intention, you know, and and give it your best effort, even even if you realize that maybe this isn't where you're gonna go. Like for me, when I said like I finished out my associate's degree, even though I realized I'm not gonna use this. Right did my best, I finished all my classes, I got my degree, and I can look back and be proud of that and know that I, I grew from that experience. And that's the sort of stuff that leads you where you're supposed to be. And I don't, what, what's funny too, is I don't have any regrets about going to school. Like if this podcast takes off, those four years of studying accounting, the courses never did anything for me, but the people I met, the financial mistakes I made, all of that contributed to developing my soft skills so that I could do this. So even that time, like on the surface, someone might look at that and be like, oh man, isn't that bummer that you went to school for four years and studied accounting when now you're running a podcast about business, fitness, and culture, and like accounting has nothing to do with it, and <laughs> you're never gonna talk about it. And I'd say no, you know, it, it was, I learned so much about myself during those four years. And, and again, I'm not saying everyone should go to should go to college. One of the guests that I had on um, was a 20 year old who dropped out of college to start his own business, and he's crushing it. So I think to your point, it's really good to just try to be as self-aware as possible. and. I forget if we were on mic or not yet, but being honest with yourself. I think that Caden is probably very honest about his abilities and he had good reason to drop out of school. He wasn't dropping out because of a rebellious act against his parents or something like that. It was he had a dream and a vision and a, a way to execute it and he acted on it and now it's paying off. That's awesome. So That's, that's um, such a hard skill to be honest with yourself. And I would... Make, if I was gonna make an assumption, I would say he's probably got some um, some good parents that are that have kind of taught him how to how to do that, which is, is good for him. And that's awesome at 20 years old to be able to have that sort of vision and drive and um, ability to be honest with yourself and be successful is that's impressive. I didn't even think about that about his parents. Maybe I'll have to call him and ask him if we can do a, a repeat episode with mom and dad. Well, I'd just be interested to see like what do they do, you know? And I guess. Did they instill that in him, or was that something he really learned for himself at a young age? That took me a long time to figure out for myself. Yeah. How to do that properly, healthy way, and to actually be honest. So I think it's one of the hardest things in life. Because, like, we were just talking about at the gym, too. You know, sometimes you want to put that extra weight on. That's not being honest with yourself, though. Right. <laughs> and something you're always battling. But so. There's, there are kids, though, that have that. Like, I'll, I'll notice in my care sometimes. I get some kids, younger kids, that are like, I'm just impressed with them. Like, man, you got your shit figured out. So you're going to do all right. 
what is what does that look like? Is it just the way they articulate themselves, or is it the, what they're talking about? Yeah, what, what what somebody talks about, I think, is is a good way to tell. You know, a, a prime example is uh, Jordan. He's a barber that cuts next to me at the shop. He's only twenty four, but when I met him, we uh, it was at my first barber shop in Cedar Park called Roosters. He was the receptionist. I think he was like sixteen or seventeen when I met him, and I was. 23. Um, and we were we were kind of cool because we were like the only dudes in the shop, uh, but we weren't super tight. We just grew over time. He's probably my best friend out here in Texas now. But he's always had this sort of like work ethic and commitment about him that really impressed me from when he was a young age. And even though he, when he was young, yeah, he was into the stuff that like other kids are into. He's the kind of person that would show up to work early and stay late, did his job well. He committed to go into barber school and pounded it out and like got better and asked the right questions and like just the way he carried himself. He just he just picked that up about people. Let's talk barber basics. Mm. And you put six words down. Do you remember this one? How long ago was it? I forget. I oh, apologize. I'm gonna give you the six words. We don't have to talk about all six of them in depth. But as I read them back to you, give me one or two of your thoughts about if any of these still stand, you know, pretty strong in your work ethic. And then I'll have some questions around them, too, from just things I've observed. But the six words are consistency, creativity, open-mindedness, respect, friendliness, and self-worth. I think maybe... All I would change about that is that that's life basics. <laughs> It'll get, they'll take you somewhere, anywhere in life, whatever, no matter what you're doing. But, but I think I've, I said that's barber basics because all the barber pages I see, they're talking about you got to do the best fade, you got to do the best edge up, and that's what's going to get you clients. And, and, and you got to, a lot of barber shops, are, you got to be the barber that's dressed the nicest. And um, a lot of these things can have some truth to them. But I think really at the end of the day, what, what gets people in your chair and coming back to you is when they realize um, that, that you are passionate about what you're doing, you respect them, you're willing to listen to them and be open-minded about who they are, and you can um, appreciate them for that. Your willingness to step out of your comfort zone and try something new. Um, and also maybe an ability to be honest and tell a client if something is out of your comfort zone and maybe something I should do off the clock we could do this for a fun project but hmm. I, I don't want to charge you money for this because that's not and they might not want that but um yeah I just i just feel like in my experience as a barber there's not a lot of great guidance out there for young barbers in terms of like who you really are as a person rather than just do a clean fade you know there's plenty of pages that'll show you how to do a fade there's not a lot that'll show you how to really carry yourself to be somebody that clients want to come back to well, because at the end of the day, you're essentially running your own business, right? Like yeah. you might be working under the umbrella of the bearded barber, but you are, you probably want a lot of your clients, I'm assuming after reading through your Instagram page, what percentage of your clients, if you had to guess, are repeat business? Um, it's a vast majority these days, like 90%. It's pretty high. Um, and I get new clients, you know, a couple times a week still. And I love that. But I also love that I'll have full days of like, man, if, cut everybody on my schedule today like five ten times and we just at that point like i already know what they're getting unless they say otherwise we're doing something different they just sit down and we start talking oh you know how are the kids what are you up to this weekend what are you doing? you know i love yeah. that that's a that's really fun yeah i i would imagine that if you if we took these words and turned them around so if you were if you were inconsistent if you had no creativity if you were close-minded if you were disrespectful, if you were rude, and if you didn't have any self-worth, what would the opposite of that be? Like if I hated myself, or if you, what would the opposite of self-worth be? Um, yeah, just not valuing yourself. Is there a word for that specifically? Like uh, somebody that is uh, sad, unhappy. Right. <laughs> <laughs> somebody that is sad. <laughs> 
<laughs> but yeah, if you, if you were those six attributes instead, it might be the opposite, where ninety percent of your clientele would be new, yeah, and only ten percent is coming back. And maybe the only reason those ten percent is coming back is because they're assholes too. <laughs> so, they pity you or something. Like, like likes like or yeah, or they yeah. pity you. They're like, yeah. man, if I don't come back to this guy, he might be on the streets in a couple months. That's not why you want people coming back to you, you know. No. <laughs> Um, as far as open-mindedness, one question I wanted to ask you was I saw your post back in October of 2019 where you made an announcement that you were leaving Roosters to join the team at Bearded Barber. In fact, it wasn't even a team. It was that, it was a brand new business from what I gathered. Was there um, – what was your thought process behind behind that move? Was it a big deal or was it just – Oh, yeah, there was a huge deal for me. I was super excited about it. I um, had been working at this Roosters – which was good for me, but I had outgrown it at that point. There's nowhere, there was like nowhere left for me to grow there really, the way it was run. Owner there was not, not a good dude. Um, he did Jordan dirty too. Stole money from him. Hmm. That's nice. I was ready to get out of there. And I had multiple, quite a few offers over the years to get out of there, but um, I really believe as a barber, like goes into the consistency part, like you don't want to move around too much. You know, you want to be in one place so people know where to find you right and your clients know where to get back to you but so I was just looking for the right place and uh Casey reaches out to me on Instagram and uh the funny part about that is when I had first moved to Texas or at least like my third move here my third and final move here um I already had the Roosters job lined up because I worked at one in Illinois for about six months and I, it was sort of a transfer but when I moved here I I reached out to some shops just to see what else was out there mm -hmm. Casey was one of the guys I reached out to. Just I found his page on Instagram, Bearded Barber. I didn't, at the time, he was actually only a single chair shop. He didn't have anything, but he never responded to me. <laughs> and uh, it was because, you know, he didn't follow me. And, and, you know, like on Instagram, you go to the messages, and then there's a little tab that says requests. Yep. And if you don't check that, you're never going to see it. Right. He's not su super, like, social media savvy. Sorry, Casey. <laughs> so he never saw it. I think he didn't admit it because, I mean, he never saw that, right? So it's like, dang, two and a half years, you never checked your message requests. <laughs> But uh, so I get this message back from him, and he's like, hey, sorry for, the, like, delay or something like that. It's like, yeah, it's two and a half years later. He's like, yeah, oh, I'm finally, I'm, I'm, I'm opening up this new shop, Bearded Barber, and uh, I really like your work and this and that, and I'd like to meet up with you. And at the time, uh, the shop that we're at that you saw was an orc vacuum cleaner shop. And uh, I think it had just started being gutted, so there's nothing there. Um, he showed me, and I was and he's like, was telling me about his vision, but there's nothing there yet. Yeah. Well, I bought into who Casey is. You know, he embodies a lot of those things that I, that we were talking about. Uh, a lot of those traits, open-mindedness, respect, creativity. And I picked up on that from him, and I was like, yeah, this is a guy that I could get behind. And obviously, he had the ambition to go and start his own shop, which is, um, that's really hard to do. That takes a lot, and he's open to it at this point. But I got behind him uh, just for who he was as a person, and so... I was I was really excited to start that and that was the first point in my career where I was like really proud to tell people where I was cutting their hair. Roosters, I kinda it was like I had to put qualifiers on it. It was like, yeah, I'm at hmm. this Roosters, yeah, I'm the only barber and it's kinda cool, you know, there's other like there's like cosmetologists in there, but you know, I do good work and it was like I had to kinda explain it to people now. I'm like, I'm at bearded barber, here's our website. I don't have to say anything. People are gonna see it for themselves and they'll just know like this is this is the real deal. Yeah. I'm curious, again, in thinking of people who might listen to this that are um, any age, but they just are working a job where they're not they're not passionate about it. Maybe they're just doing it as a paycheck, as a means to an end until they find that thing that they enjoy. Was there any attributes that you remember about Casey that you realized you wanted to align yourself with, with his vision? Um. As in, you know, things that I wanted to pick up or the things I liked or... Well, you mentioned that you got behind Casey. Yeah. Why? Like, what was it? Yeah. Why, you know, what... Well, he's passionate about cutting hair. He's really good at cutting hair. Um, And he, he definitely understands that it's not all about... It's not all about the haircut. It's about a lot of the, the way you carry yourself and the way you treat your clients. You know, that's really going to get you more clients than your fade at the end of the day. I think one way that he put it to me uh, was like, you can assume 
that if somebody's cutting in a nice barber shop, they're doing good work. So under the assumption that all barbers are doing pretty good work in the area, how are you going to set yourself apart? And that's the way you carry yourself. And, and um, yeah, he just, he's, he's, he's a good person that um, he's good work for. So it sounds like, uh, I don't know if you've ever heard that phrase, staying with the devil you know versus joining the devil you don't. Um, I have heard it. Was so. there, even though the situation at Roosters wasn't ideal, was there any fear about making that jump? Or were you pretty confident of like, this can only be good for me? No, I absolutely think anytime. I can't I can only speak for myself anytime. Um, I've done any sort of change in my barber career from moving shops to raising prices. There's like a little fear behind it because um, maybe less so nowadays, but at that point, definitely, I was like, man, it's it like 14 miles away from my old shop. I was like, man, how many people are going to follow me here? Hmm. Um, and, and there was some work that had to be done on that, and too, like, for me, um, getting sort of in contact with my clients from Roosters, because technically the owner of Roosters didn't want me doing any of that, to... Um, hand out cards or things like that. So I didn't necessarily break any of his rules, but if my client decides to follow me on Instagram because it's my Instagram handle, now he can see me or where I'm at, you know what I mean? Because yeah. I can post. So I was trying to I was trying to respect uh, his rules because, you know, that, that's a contract I signed, but I also got to look out for myself. So um, the first week at Bearded Barber, I think, I 75% of my books was guys from Roosters. <laughs> and that filled out like a week plus before I even started. And uh, it was a pretty cool moment to be like, uh, I was on vacation at the time. I had a little bit of off time because uh, the guy at Roosters, instead of giving, I put my two weeks in, he walked me, which I knew he was going to do. Yeah. Because uh, I had talked to some of the other people that worked there before. He wasn't going to give me my two weeks because, in his words, that's not how he does business. Um, so I was like, well, I'm going to have a couple of extra weeks. Let's take a vacation. We went to uh, Destin. And I just remember like kind of looking at the books and like, oh, feeling really good about that. Yeah. Like, man, these guys, like, they're going to drive all the way from Cedar Park or wherever to come get a haircut from me still, even though I'm going up in price and going farther away. Like, that was really cool. That's awesome, man. Yeah. Was there, and then, so you join um, Bearded Barber. And then six months later, we have this wonderful pandemic that hit us. Yeah. And I think I saw that you guys did close for maybe six weeks from like mid-March to about early May. Um, I want to say it was, it was like two and a half months, so maybe 10 weeks. Okay. Somewhere in there. I can't remember exactly, but yeah, it was at least two months. Do you remember, to the best of your, your memory, when you guys first shut down, like, imagine that wasn't easy. Do you crazy. know what was going through your head at the time? Yeah. Especially in, fear. especially because if someone had been at a job for like, I don't know, five years or something and the COVID hit, I guess it would just feel different than I just switched jobs and now like, fuck, yeah. we just shut our doors and we just opened them. Yeah. But what what were you afraid of at the time? Um, that like the shop wouldn't get back. I guess I always like, I believe in myself and like if that shop had shut down, I'm going to figure it out. Maybe I do open my own thing, but. I'm going to be okay at the end of the day, but I was like, man, we just got this going, and now this is happening. Ended up being pretty great for us, honestly. First of all, I got two months paid through the uh, PPP loan program. Um, so I got like 75% of my pay for for two months to sit at home and play uh, Warzone, hmm. which had just dropped, and that was like a pretty magical time. <laughs> 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 I got so good at that game, man, and, and everybody was off work. So me and my buddies were like, get up, get on Warzone, play for 12 hours, smoke, drink. Yep. It was a grand old time. I was getting paid to do it. So I got no worries. At least once that first, before that first check hit, I'm like, am I actually going to get this money? Like, it was like hard to believe. And then sure enough, it hits my account. And I'm like, fuck, awesome. Yeah. <laughs> so then we come back from COVID. We're packed. Like, we actually, because of that, we actually took an hour off the end of our day. We used to work at six. And those first two weeks back from COVID, um, we weren't doing beard trims. We weren't doing beards because everyone had their masks on. So, hmm. so we do 30-minute haircuts. 
and everybody in the shop's books was not a single gap. 30 minute haircut, 30 minute haircut, 30 minute haircut, open and close from nine to six. Well, we all have an hour lunch booked in there, but other than that, it was two weeks, absolutely book solid. So we're talking about like 75 haircuts a week. and For one person. Yeah. And um, we were just like drained and, and, and we got to talking and we we're like, uh, you know what, maybe we should take an hour off the day, like. Uh, Casey, he's got young kids, and he's like, I don't have the energy to like be with my family at the end of the day. Like, this is too much. So we actually took an hour off, but that was like, the fattest paycheck I'd ever gotten at that point <laughs> after those two weeks. <laughs> yeah. And after those two weeks, we ended up deciding to bring beard trims back on. We're like, dude, we're sitting in here right in people's faces. Like, if, it, if, it's, if we're going to get it, we're going to get it. Like, this mask ain't going to stop it. So if they want to get a beard trim and they're comfortable with it, then we're going to do it. We're like the only shop in the area doing that. So we gained a lot of clients through that. Yeah. A lot of people, barbers weren't doing them. And so they'd come to us just for the beard trim. And then eventually they'd come, they're like, fuck it, I'm just going to get my hair and beard here. And we, we actually grew a lot because of that. Yeah. That's sick. Yeah. I think I know why everyone, why you guys were booked back to back those first two weeks. What was that? Wait, All the COVID it, hair? Was it because most everyone looked like this? <laughs> That's exactly what everybody looked like. <laughs> Dude, this was one of my favorite before and afters. Was that <laughs> that's, one? Hey, that's Jordan's work. Yeah, and and it was because you you know you just looked like such a schmuck in, in the before picture. I was like, you didn't look like a schmuck, but you that's how all of us looked. I don't think any of us were getting up every day worried about taking care of ourselves. We that's seen anybody. That's that's when I grew my beard before COVID. I always kept it. You know, I was always I had an in office job visiting clients and so I kept it much shorter. Um, I don't know what you would call it, but because it was longer than stubble, like it was established, but it was, I think it was summer of 2020 or somewhere around there that I just stopped touching it and it got longer and longer. And then eventually I started going to a barber and having them clean it up. But yeah, man, I'm sure, I I, I wonder if, if Google knows how many guys grew beards because we just stopped caring for <laughs> a couple months. Yeah. And a lot of guys kept them, and now that's just more clients for us. But I, that picture is like the longest I think my hair's ever been, other than when I was like three years old. Ever since then, I've been buzzing it. And I, was, I remember my hair touching my ears, and it bugged me so much, and I had never felt that. I had no memory of feeling that before. And I was like, I can't do this. That picture, that one made me laugh. I don't know why, but when I stumbled on it and I switched to the after and then I went back to the before, it just made me chuckle. It partly just because his memories, you know, of like, yeah, that was that was just all of us. You know, we were just unkempt little boys because of yeah. being locked in our homes for two months with, like you said, I was getting that money too. And I had the exact same reaction before the money hit. It sort of seemed like false hope, you know. It's like, is this are reinforcements really on their way? And then that morning came where I poured my coffee, got a push notification from my bank, and I opened it up. I was like, Ooh, oh man, yeah. wow. <laughs> yeah, like I could get used to that. You know? right. <laughs> Um, a lot of people did <laughs> too much <laughs> probably I, like you you got back at, into after two months i think mine was a, almost identical it was i i got laid off in late april and somewhere around june or july i was i was back to work and i was itching for it it was fun at first and then somewhere between like six and ten weeks the fun started to fade away and i was just like man my hair is a mess i'm drinking more and I, I ain't doing shit with my life, you know? <laughs> Let's get back to the grind. Yeah, so that picture, um, we all, there was four of us in the shop at that point, and we all went to the shop, like, I think it was just a day early to uh, remember how to cut hair. <laughs> <laughs> so Did you all just do each other? Yeah, so we all traded cuts. We all needed one bad. <laughs> we all traded cuts, and I kind of got back in the groove a little bit. And you got to, uh, you know, I don't know if those first clients, like, thought about that at all that we hadn't cut hair in two and a half months and they were going to be the first person sitting back in our chair. They but probably didn't care. They, they probably, probably didn't like, care. This, you, it's, they're not going to make it off. worse. Yeah. Just just help me. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, you got to love those clients that are willing to come back to you after two and a half months off. Yeah. In terms of self-worth, I found the post in 2021 where you did that price increase. I sort of had a few thoughts around this. I was hoping you would talk about it. Was it a good move? Um... Let's start with that. You know, it was over a year ago now. I, I have no idea what your rates were. 
are they still increased? Did you end up lowering them back down? What happened with that? Yeah, we went up to, I want to say 50. I want to say we started at 40 bucks when I was first there. So when I was at Roosters, it was 33, and then I moved to Breeder Barber, and it was 40. And then after, it wasn't even a full year, we uh, increased our rates to 50 bucks, and it was an awesome move. Like, when I got back, I was, I think, I think, like, once you're booking out, even just a couple weeks, I think I was booked out two weeks or so in advance at that point. Like, you got to raise your rates. That's the only way left to grow. There's no more time left, unless you're going to add hours on your day, which we were doing opposite. Like I said, we took an hour off. The only way left to grow is to raise your rates and with that you know I'm not going to say any names but you it's funny that the, the clients that you lose from that are kind of the guys that you're like cool <laughs> <laughs> great <laughs> you know what's fu- so funny about you saying that is for any business owners or potential business owners that are listening is I had a boss that did that several years ago with an accounting firm so think about that you're like we're delivering tax returns and audits to people and we raised our rates and you know what he said? Word for word, what you just said. The clients that I lost, thank God. Yeah. If I knew that all I had to do was raise my rates and I'd be making more money while getting rid of my problem child, like I would have done this a year ago. <laughs> yeah, 100%. And I raised rates again after, since then and um, went up to 64 haircut. And again, same deal. Barely lost anybody. Maybe a couple guys, and it's like, okay, I'm not, I'm not upset about that. Like, um, I think, you know, something I've noticed on Instagram barber culture is barbers that want to like almost like want how much they charge, which I don't think is really a healthy way to go about that. But I think that you should just be conscious of what your books look like. And if you're booking out far in advance and you got people texting you left and right, hey, you got a spot here, can you get me in? Can you, then it's time to raise your rates. And you're never going to regret that. Yeah. But, and you got to do it in a reasonable way. Like, I think 10 bucks is a pretty good, like, standard raise. You could maybe do a percentage or whatever, but 10 bucks is, I think, pretty, like, hey, I'm going to go out 10 bucks. And anybody that really um, appreciates you for a lot of those things that we were talking about earlier, more than just the cut, are going to. They're gonna have no problem with that. In fact, you got guys. I got guys telling me hey, you should have gone on more, which I think about. <laughs> I mean, it's I gonna happen I... eventually. I'm already. I'm like a month out right now. Um, so I could do it. But you're I, booked a month out right now. Yeah, I love that. For a beer trim, it's not quite so bad. I was it's gonna only say, a I'm, I'm, I'm about to book my next beer trim right when you leave tonight. Yeah. Because <laughs> I'm going back home in May, and I was thinking I want to get get cleaned up right before I leave. Yeah. So. Well, Worst case, you text me. I'll make sure I get you in. Well, like, I, I won't be that client. I'll, I'll be proactive about it. But I did see a couple posts where you you said uh, you said book now and book often, or you'll, else yeah. you'll be going to your Plan B barber. So <laughs> if anyone wants a, a trim from Phil for birthdays, parties, Christmas, Easter, don't wait till the night before Easter because yeah, it's too late for Easter be, at this point. <laughs> yeah, too many mops to chop. Too many mops to chop. Yeah. Huh. Is there, outside of your schedule being full, was there, going back to self-awareness and the price raise, was there anything else where you knew you were ready or was it really just looking at your schedule and like, you like was was that it or what else went into it thought-wise? Yeah. Honestly, I really think that's it. Yeah. Supply and demand. Well, I'll, I'll say this. Also, I was looking at what other shops in the area are charging. I always try to keep a gauge on that. Um. And I, I do that through looking at what the shops by us are charging. And I also like to look if I see a barber that's um, doing really great work on Instagram. Um, I like to look at what they're charging and what their books look like. And Actually, I do that for barbers, all types of barbers. I like, um, maybe it's not, well, I'll just say, they're, like you see a lot of barbers that though, really like to hype themselves up. And that's good. There's, there's value to to that but i'll look at their books i'm like i don't think you're really giving us the full picture that's the easiest that's the quickest way to tell um i think how good a barber is what their books look like yeah um so yeah i i 
I was like, uh, there's like Burge or Finley's or Floyd's. Some of them changed down from us. There's a couple other barber shops. I was like, what are they charging? We have the better atmosphere. We got the better barbers. We should be charging more. Yeah. It only makes sense. You kind of, you go to buy, um, if you go to buy a bottle of whiskey, um, you might not know a thing about, you might have three bottles of whiskey, two bottles of whiskey. You don't have to know anything about them, though. but the one that costs more, you automatically assume is better. Hmm. Right? Yeah. You just do. And maybe after you've tried them all, you might say it differently, but at least off the bat, your first thing is like, this is the more expensive one, it's the better one. So I believe we are the better barbershop, so we need to market ourselves that way. Right. It's it's funny, man, playing the the comparison, not the comparison game, but like you said, talking, you, I think it's good to use the com- competition as a data point, right? What are the other barbershops charging? And I've been thinking about this for my own personal Patreon, because as I mentioned to you, this is becoming something I'm passionate enough about. I want to do it full time. So at first, I think I set up three tiers on Patreon that you could subscribe at $5 a month, 10 or 15. And I didn't put the dollar amounts that high because one, I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> uh, two, I, you know, I don't, I don't know. I didn't feel, maybe I didn't have as much self-confidence, but then one guest in particular came on and whether he was being kind or he meant it. And I think he meant it. He was like, dude, this thing's going to blow up. So if you want this to be your day job, like you should increase those tiers a little bit. So I went and I switched them to a $5 tier, a $25 tier and a $50 tier. And then even wondering like, should there be a thousand dollar tier in here? Like what if some random person hears the episode and he's, he or she is like, I want this thing to go viral. Sure. I'll be the one person that subscribes at a thousand bucks a month. So then I did exactly what you did. And I looked up someone, I'm not going to say who, who I assume based off what I know of this individual um, is leading a pretty successful life. And I go to his Patreon page. And guess what his three tiers were? Some are yours or? $3, $5, and $7. Really? And I'm like, wait a second. What the actual fuck? Like, I didn't know what I was going to find, but I thought, you know, the $5 one makes sense. What if, like, my 18-year-old sister wants to support me? That one's perfect for, like, her. Or even a buddy who maybe doesn't have a ton of money, but he believes in me. You know, it's it's that level where someone can go in and say, we're going to throw a few dollars towards David Saturday and I said that great but I guess I was expecting on his he would have had like a spiked tier next like a hundred dollars a month and then maybe there would have even been like a corporate tier where like five thousand dollars a month you know I don't know what I was expecting but to see three and five and seven and knowing that this guy makes his money off of his business it a made me want to research him a bit more to try to figure out does he also have funding come where, coming from somewhere else? But I want to also ask him, like, why three, five, and seven? Because they're all so close to each other that it almost, why not just make one tier at five bucks? And like, what? <laughs> yeah, that doesn't make any sense to me. I think there might be more to that. And just because somebody's successful doesn't mean they're doing everything uh, right necessarily, or doesn't mean they couldn't be doing it better, right? Like, Maybe he is making all his money off of those three, five, and seven tiers, but maybe he'd be making more if he went to five, 25, and 50. You know, maybe he just hadn't thought about it that much. That really doesn't, like, that doesn't make sense to be three, five, and seven. I'm glad I'm not the only one who thinks it's strange from, and, and, and that's why I do like Patreon is, it's not like I'm selling a product like a water bottle where I have to say it's going to be a set price of four ninety nine a bottle. You know, it's cool because you can set those different tiers. So the right people will sign up at five, the right people will sign up at 25, and the right people will sign up at 50. Um, so I'm not overthinking it too much. And I even think I put on the home page, if you want to set tier at a specific dollar amount, tell me. So if someone messaged me and was like, I'll sign up for a buck a month, I'll make another tier and I'll put it at a buck a month. So that's what's sort of cool is you can, you can fluctuate it and do whatever you want with it. Um, but yeah, I'm just, I'm ranting at this I think point. What, I think if I was going to give you any advice on that is, um, you might not want the dollar a month guys. <laughs> and I guess to, to, for you, that's just money, but making that separate dollar tier might take away from the guy that then would have, he might've gone with the $5 tier, but now you got the $1, he's like, eh, I'll just do the one. But if it weren't there, he would have gone five. Right. And that makes up for five $1 guys. You know, I mean, sometimes just having that lower option available might take away from somebody that would have gone with the higher, the higher tier, if that makes sense. That almost makes me think, too, like, you know, always leave the $5 one there, but should the other two tiers be even higher? 
I, you know, and again, I'm just, I, I truly don't know. I'm 13 episodes in, yeah. been doing this for two months, always worked for a company that just paid me. I've never put thought into where should I be valuing myself, but also being acknowledging the fact that because I'm a new podcast, it should be valued at that. I don't know, man. You know, I'm I'm probably overanalyzing it to a certain extent. Maybe it does make sense to have a dollar for a little while. Um, and then you do something like, hey, starting this date, all my $1 subscribers are going to be changed to five. I don't know if you could do that. Or the dollar tier is going to be eliminated. You just got to make it make sense, you know. I can say in the barbering world, I see it all the time, where I'll go and check these guys' prices, and they're doing a 45-minute haircut for or we'll say a 30 minute haircut for, for 50 bucks and a 15 minute beard trim for 15 bucks. Every beard trim, you're losing a ton of money. Hmm. You know what I mean? So for me, it's 30 minute haircuts at 60, 15 minute beard trims at 30. I don't want to do a service that um, I'm losing money on. For, we, I do give a little deal for combos, which um, I'm not gonna lie, at some point I might change that too. But that doesn't make sense, right? Like, why would you make a service where you lose money every time you get it? It doesn't make sense. Yeah, so, well, a lot of barbers do that. And they might be successful barbers. They might make good money. doesn't mean they're going to be doing it a little better, you know. So maybe that guy just hasn't really thought it through all the way. Maybe not. I'm going to research him a little more because I, I think there must be another source of funding, whether yeah. it's he has ads on his podcast or whatever it may be. Like, there's got to be something else. Or maybe he just has thousands of people throwing three to seven bucks at him every month <laughs> it, it just works yeah, yeah. you know and sometimes when things just work they don't you're, you're not forced to change it yeah um i had a question for you you had a post that you said it's the little things that count do you give i didn't write the entire quote down but i think it was do you give um like eyebrow trims and ear hair plucks pulls when someone comes in for a for a beer trim, do you still do that? Hundred percent. You do. Yeah, I did yours. <laughs> I wasn't really paying attention. Most people don't. You just do it, and 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 subconsciously, like you just know you got taken care of. And I used to ask about it, and it's sort of like when you ask, "Hey, do you want me to trim your hair?" Some guys are like, "Well, I don't want you to feel like you're doing extra for me," so they say, "No, I don't ask anymore." If somebody doesn't want it, that will make it clear to you. You'll even get close. They're like, oh, no, no, don't trim my ear hairs, which is like, why would you say that? But <laughs> I, do, I do have one. I like my ear hair, ear hair, said I, nobody. <laughs> I have one guy I can think of off the top of my head who keeps his eyebrows. He do not want me to touch them when they're not early. But he likes them to like a feature. He's a grandpa, you know, and he's like, he's his grand, grandkids love him or something. I get it. I get it. But yeah, I just do it. And I definitely like preach that to my other barbers in the shop. Like, that's the kind of stuff that could set you apart. Like, it takes you 30 seconds to trim some ear hair and snip an eyebrow hair. Like That's easy. But that's the type of stuff that gets people back in your chair. And talking about the little things, I have a story for you, and I'm curious to get your thoughts on it. Um, before I started shaving my own head, I would go to the barber shop to do it. I didn't. I guess I just didn't know I could shave my own head, or I thought I'd walk away with like seven different cuts and be a bloody mess. And so I went to a barber shop and I was sort of bouncing around trying to find someone that I enjoyed. Um, this speaks to your friendliness factor. I was trying to, to find someone I enjoyed being in their company for 45 minutes, you know, every couple of weeks. And so I was bouncing around to the different barbers, watching A, who cut me, who didn't, who was on time for the appointment, just like looking at these little things. And one day um, I walk in, you could set an appointment or you could just walk in. So one day I walk in with no appointment and there's a new guy in there. And he looks like he just jumped out of like a Peaky Blinders episode. You familiar with that show? I'm familiar. So he had like super shaved sides and then. So he was actually bald as well. And I was like, okay. cool. So maybe he shaves his own head, which that's a that's a plus. Um, but he had on um, a vest and like a pinstripe shoe a suit and uh, very nice shoes. And this guy just he he dressed like a barber from the 1930s is what I imagine barbers may have dressed like. So I thought that guy, I don't care what the weight is. I'll wait for him. So he gave, he, he gave me a super clean shave, zero cuts, very friendly. Um, and then at the end of it, he put these two 
like vibrator things on his hands and he clicks them on and he gave me this like little 30 second massage and it felt so good and i'd never had that happen to me before i'd never i've got like massages but not a barber just you know and it felt great especially me i got sore necks sore shoulders sore back so i appreciated the hell out of it fast forward two or three cuts and one day he doesn't have his vest on Fast forward another couple cuts, and now maybe he has the pants, but he's just wearing a t-shirt. Fast forward another couple cuts, and now he's in basketball shorts and a white t-shirt. Uh, fast forward another couple cuts, the massages are now going away. And now he's showing up looking like he just got out of six weeks of getting paid to play video games, not giving his massages. And um, I don't know, man, it bugged me a little bit. And so at that point, I went and just, uh, I think I YouTubed. Oh no, it was one of my buddies. That's right. One of my buddies was giving me shit about not shaving my own head. And I thought this individual has gone downhill. I don't know what's going on with him, but for some reason it bugged me that he dressed the way he did, which is funny because if I had met him when he was in basketball shorts and a t-shirt, I never would have set that expectation. But since he set the bar up here and lowered his own bar, I noticed so I shaved my own head and my very first time doing it, I didn't cut myself a single time and I never went back to him and he lost a client for essentially forever. Yeah. Well, well, you also probably wouldn't have waited for him and gone to him the first time had he not dressed the way he did. But I think that um, probably speaks to the power of who you surround yourself with. You know, he's the only guy in the shop doing that stuff, dressing that way. And he's in a shop surrounded by people that aren't doing that stuff. And eventually you kind of go down to their level. I can't speak for certain why, but, you know, it's kind of disappointing to hear that he was up here and he ended up down here. Did you did you say anything to him about it? Never. It's, it's not your job. <laughs> but maybe... Hey. And that's not like a really comfortable conversation to have. Hey, man, why do you look like a schmuck? <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't have said it that way. <laughs> but, but I think, though, that there's like... Hey, Dad. Um, you can have some really powerful conversations with people. Sometimes they don't think people notice. You might not think people notice, but when you say, hey, man, I noticed when I first came to you, you were in that suit and you were in that, doing that massage and everything like that, and I noticed how you're wearing these basketball shorts you're not doing anymore. Like, what's going on? And maybe he hasn't really realized that he, he'd fallen that far from, from grace, right? Or fallen that far down, you know, sometimes. Yeah, yeah. Um, like I said, that's not your job, but. I find myself thinking about that type of stuff more when I notice those things. David now would have asked him. Yeah. I would have. Even just a couple weeks ago, man, there was a, we were going to, uh, I was going to Los Angeles um, for a work trip. We jump on the plane. I'm on the aisle, middle seat's empty. There's a guy on the window seat. And as the plane take, is taken off, like the stewardess had done her announcements, the engine had fired up. And he gets a call about something that was going on, on with his son. And it was the worst possible timing. And uh, um, plane takes off. So he ends the call. And he sort of, he didn't have a hood on. He had like a shirt on like what I do now. And he sort of raised it up like this. And just started crying on the airplane. And like the, that timing, you know, of like you're about to be cut off from, from uh, your data. So we get up. And I waited for the plane to level out because I knew the, you know, the volume would go down a little bit and I didn't want to bring attention to the guy. And I waited till he seemed like he had composed himself. And then I, I you know, ended up saying whatever. But point is, um, we had a beautiful conversation the entire flight. I think that the, the fact that I acknowledged, you know, what he was going through, he really appreciated. He said he did when we got off the flight and shook hands and parted ways. Um, but to your point, like, that took it again it took me a while to get there you know i don't know why david in his 20s would maybe either judge the guy or just be like oh this is super awkward you know my barber's not in his suit the guy next to me is crying but people appreciate that shit, and i'm trying to do it more if appropriate you sort of got to feel it out on a case-by-case -case basis but in this case like me and homeboy were stuck sitting next to each other for 90 minutes why would i not just lean over and hey <laughs> you need anything yeah um, and in that case, he needed someone to talk to for 60 minutes, so I was happy to do that. Um, why did I go off on this tangent? Well, I just mentioned that you could have, I asked if you had said anything to the barber about uh, sort of 
falling off and having that uncomfortable conversation. I certainly in my 20s would not have had that conversation either. I just don't think I even would have thought about that way. Like you said, I would have just judged him for it and moved on or whatever. But It's because you said it was powerful. Yeah. What I was going to say is sometimes if you, if you keep your eye out for them, you can have some really good conversations with people. But if your eyes are close to it, to those opportunities, that is a missed opportunity because I wasn't looking because I was too worried about myself and, oh, well, it's me. I need to go find a new barber again. Ah, you know, I wasn't looking at it from the perspective of like kindness and compassion and just asking him because the way you phrased it was beautiful. Hey, man, when I first, you know, chose you, it was because of this. You good? Can I do anything for you today? Maybe give him a bigger tip. You know, I don't know. <laughs> Well, maybe you don't need to even do anything for him, but just bring it to his attention and let him know that you notice. All right. I have a question for you because I wasn't able to figure this out. Who is Sean? Is he your brother? And yeah. do you or do you not have the same mother? We do have the same mother. He's my younger brother. He's six years younger than me. Okay. And he's an awesome dude. Super tight. I should Super tight. <laughs> super tight. We're, we're super tight as well. He's super tight. You know. No, that's cool. I, just, I, I haven't described like a friend or a family member. I should have wrote the post down or taken a snapshot of them or something. But there is one where you were, you'd said something like, man, you know, I'm so glad that his mom lets me borrow him or I forget what the verbiage was, but I, I, there is one post that threw me off. I was like, wait, are they brothers or are they not? Sometimes I'll say things in a post that's maybe like an inside joke or something that you really have to know me well to know and um I, I know when i post it like most people probably won't get that guess but i just say something to be goofy that's fair um the last topic on barber basics or people basics as we have found out is i guess i tied this into friendliness in my notes but in your Instagram, consistently throughout your posts, you'll say something about like, you know, I don't have to say the best because the proof is in the picture. Or, you know, you'll make some claims like, you know, I'm one of the best barbers in Austin. And even as I'm saying it right now, it's coming off as like cocky. But when I met you and when I was going through your Instagram, I never once thought like, oh, you know, this guy's being real arrogant. You have a, a very humble confidence to yourself. And I wonder how, if someone else wanted to achieve that, like, I'm not even really sure what the question is, except to maybe say, if someone else had a goal of walking through life with a humble confidence, how do you think you got to that place where you can say, I know I'm one of the better barbers in town, but me, I don't take that as like cockiness. I'm just like, well, first I see it because you did a great job on my beard, but also like you, you seem like a very humble person at the same time. I well, appreciate you saying that. Um, I guess the short answer is I, I would just believe it. I really believe it. And that's because I've done my research on the other barbers in Austin. I know what their cuts look like. I know what they're charging. I know there's other really good barbers out there, but I believe in myself and that came through a lot of trial and error a lot of being honest with myself and trying to embody some of those things we talked about earlier. And I just trying to, trying to be my best every day. Like I really go into every day trying to be my best. So as long as I go into every day with that mindset, you know, I have conversations with myself most mornings, sometimes at night. Like, this is who I'm gonna be today. Think about what I'm gonna do and what kind of person I wanna be in those situations. And then um, sometimes when you when life gives you those little situations like the ones we were talking about earlier, the guy in the plane and the guy, you're ready for him because you um, you prepared yourself to be that person that day and and you get to and you get to make a difference. And I love that. I love getting to do that. So I try to go into every day with that mentality and, and I like being that person. That's just who I want to be. When you say you have those conversations with yourself, do you try to... To, will you take a few minutes every morning and actually just sit in like quietness, almost like a form of meditation? Yeah, usually in the shower. Start your day with a shower. Or, you know, I do let my dog out, a couple yeah. things. Sit in the shower for a minute and thinking like, like today it was, um, I'm going to go in and I'm going to try to be a great barber and a great 
leader of that barber shop and embody what I think makes a great barber and maybe a uh, you know I've got something like oh, I've got a podcast today to do and I'm going to try to um, just be honest and open and and um, do my best you know like just short little things try to think through my day a little bit sometimes at night too I find it will help me if I'm having a, some anxiety about something or whatever I'll run through my whole day in my head like what's it going to look like and I'll sort of like mentally prepare myself for that and I feel like that just helps me to have a confidence about me, I guess, because I've already thought about a lot of how this is going to go, and I know who I want to be in this moment. If you have a, I'm asking this purely for for selfish reasons, um, and I'll tell you why after you answer. But if you have a day coming up where you know there's going to be something challenging, whether it's a, you know, it could be a rough conversation with the significant other, maybe a difficult client, maybe you know the boss is going to be unhappy about something, but you know that either the next day or you know, at some point today, you're going to be walking into a difficult situation. How do you mentally get yourself ready for that? Or or do you just let things spiral out of control? And <laughs> Do my best not to let it get there because I've been there before. <laughs> and that's not a fun place in life. Um, I think about it like going to the gym, you know, how did you get to the point where you can lift 225 on your bench? You did it a little bit at a time. Maybe you, you got to warm up. And, and why do you do it? You do it how do I put this? You, you, um, when you feel that burn when you're doing your bench press, it sucks, right? It's tough. You got to work through it, but you know why you're doing it. And so when you get those tough moments in life, that's when you, um, you get to make yourself, like that's what you grow through. So I try to keep that sort of perspective on it. Like this is going to be a tough conversation. This is why I'm having it. This is how it's going to make me better. Hmm. So I, I just try to, it's almost like working out, right? Like this is, that's how you get better. And I had one of those recently with a barber that didn't quite make it at our shop because he just wasn't ready yet. It was on me. I brought him on without realizing where he was. and That was stressing me out. Like I knew I was going to have that conversation with him. I was going to have to let him go. It went really well. He handled it really well. He's a good dude, a stand-up dude. And I always knew he was going to handle it well, I guess, but still not a fun conversation to have. So I did a lot of that, like preparing myself mentally and thinking about why am I doing this and who do I want to be in this conversation? I love that, man. That's very, very well put that even beforehand, instead of instead of spiraling, looking at it as, I know this is going to be tough, but I also know I'm going to grow from this because we've sort of talked about it a little bit, but I know when I think about my challenges, I think those definitely were something that sharpened the blade, so to speak, you know? And if it wasn't for Lowe's, would I still just be a butter knife, you know, damn near ineffective. So I, I, I like that. That's a good reminder. I might even throw that one on a sticky note if I can somehow think about how to articulate it in a sentence of, you know, this isn't a moment to be in pain. This is a moment to sharpen the blade or, you know, I'll have to kneel that one over a few times until something catchy catches on. But one of your posts, you mentioned surrounding yourself with people that push you. I agree 100%. But also easy, easy to say, right? To and easy to believe potentially. If you felt like you're in a place in life where you're not surrounded by people that push you, how do you start to to change that environment? Yeah, that's a tough question. I don't think everybody definitely does not have that. You know, a lot of people don't have that. So how do you get it? I mean, I I think I'm really lucky to have a older sister that really pushes me and challenges me. So I've always had that sort of intimate connection with somebody that was there for me to push me. And I know not everybody has that. But um, throughout life, you'll meet people that excel in a certain area that maybe you want to excel in. For instance, I told you earlier about my client that's a power lifter that gave me a workout routine. That's a guy that can make me better at he knows a lot more about lifting than I do. And so you got to kind of humble yourself and say, I'm going to listen to this guy and I'm going to let him teach me some things, you know. And that can be tough to do, to listen to somebody teach you something you think you might already know some stuff about, but just say, you know what, I'm going to listen to him, I'll let him do it, I'm going to let him give me this workout routine and I'm just going to do it. And like, I guess 
try to identify somebody that excels in an aspect that you want to get better at and allow them to teach you whatever that may be you know there's people that are passionate about things they love it when when somebody's ready to learn from them not everybody is you know I could talk to a million people about barbering but most of them wouldn't end up being great barbers right like yeah it'd only be the people that were already sort of had that in them and wanted to learn so you got to be ready for it first of all and and then you gotta you might have to seek it out but that's tough because you know not everybody has that surrounding them have you by chance seen have you has anyone ever come into the bearded barber whether it was you or one of your colleagues and they saw your guys' passion and energy and as a result you ended up referring them to a barber school and you were able to see that journey has that happened yet by chance i've certainly had people talk about oh i thought about it and i'll give them some advice you can i can pick up on if somebody's really serious about it i'm always going to give them my best advice i can but i don't know that i've ever seen anybody come through and actually then become a barber um the closest thing to that would be jordan because he was just a receptionist at the roosters that i worked at and then he showed interest and um, I sort of helped him get signed up at Roffler and then, you know, helped him to get in that bearded barber, but he's the one that put all the work in, you know. Can't do it for him, but when somebody's ready, do your best to help him out. You know, you can guide him. Yeah. I love getting to do that. I'm starting to get the opportunity now at bearded barber to lead by example. I think that's one of the most powerful things you can do in life is to lead by example. I'm hoping, uh, I was telling you before we started recording that someone helped me get this podcast up and running. And I'm saying this now only to sort of get it out into the universe a little bit. I think it'd be cool if one day, you know, whether it was a guest on the podcast, just like that was the situation with me and this gentleman. You know, I was a guest on his pod, called him up, asked him for some advice. And he, without any hesitation or reservation, was very happy to give it. And uh, I do hope for that one day, man. You know, I don't know why, but I just, I'd love to be able to be a part of knowing that, like, behind the scenes I was able to help someone just get the bare bones going and then see it get off and running and I hope the same for you too I hope that you find you know someone lands in your chair and whatever it is you look for when you can tell if they're serious or not about it they have it and I don't know I just knowing what little I know about you I feel like you'd really enjoy that and that'd bring a lot of fulfillment to you yeah I, I'm getting to do that a bit with um, our newest barber Dakota he's really talented and um got plenty of room to grow but he's, he's gonna be an awesome barber Hell yeah and and yeah i hope that for you as well and i definitely believe in the power of, of speaking things into existence sort of like when i say you know i believe i'm the best barber in austin if i don't believe that why the hell is anyone else going to believe it um so there's a lot more that goes into that kind of how we talked about but um you got to believe it and you got to be willing to preach it and practice it i was listening to an interview do you know who alex cooper is not off the top of my head no her podcast i think is sometimes just as highly ranked as rogan's is hmm. and she recently did an interview and i read the on someone else's podcast and i read a quick synopsis of what they talked about and it sounded like it was the bulk of it was going to be around her podcast and where it started versus how she got to being the second highest ranked podcast in the world and one of the things that i love that she said and it's now a sticky note on my uh on my bathroom mirror is that she wished that she had treated her podcast as if it was becoming as if it would be the next big thing whether it became the next big thing or it didn't because she made so many mistakes because she undervalued it oh this is just a podcast it's just david having fun no big deal it's not going to make me any money. It's not going to go anywhere. So sure, I'll have subpar guests on. I'm not going to ask for the 50 bucks on, on Patreon. She always treated it. Um, excuse me, not always. In the beginning stages, she admitted that she did not treat it with a type of respect. And could it have even became even bigger, even faster, with less pain and less mistakes if she had gone into it with the mentality of, this is the next big thing. And I thought, you know what, Alex, I like that. And I look up to you quite a bit. So I went and found my sticky note and I wrote David Saturday night. Every decision 
that you make with David Saturday Night Sit Back, make it as if it's the next big thing. And and I just I love that mentality of of and the way you just articulated it and the way she articulated it because even it almost just boils down to like just have some self respect just respect yourself and your work and the fact that you're taking two hours out of your evening evening to sit down with Phil like why would I disrespect you or me you know treat it with respect yeah, self worth right yeah uh, I love that that's that's great advice um and and like you. You can approach everything in life with that. Why, would, why wouldn't you do it to be the best that you can be? It's hard, really hard to do. Like I don't think anybody does it, everything, but you can always try to be self-aware and be conscious of maybe I can do this to be a little better. Maybe I can do that. Yeah. Um, but it seems like you are taking this really seriously. Like I, I really like your setup you got here. and um, You were, um, I guess thorough and easy to communicate with and um reached out to me um how do I put it like I don't want to say you like bug me about it but you reached out to me and you followed up and you're like I could tell you you serious you wanted to do this and that made me feel more like awesome this is this guy's serious like I want to be part of this I want to um do what I can and be part of this process like I'm excited I'm happy that I'm able to do this with you I'm happy you're here man and I'm thoroughly enjoying the conversation um, one question I had for you. Are we doing okay on time? Yeah, I'm good. I got, I got nothing going. Awesome. Sabrina's working tonight, so. We will power through for another four hours then. Cool. <laughs> no, <I'm here. laughs> we got more beer, so we're ready. Um, I got my work clothes in the truck, so I'm good. <laughs> yeah. Kim will freshen up the beards. and <laughs> Don't ever let me touch your beard. That's why I don't touch my own. I just Nobody some... touches his beard but me. But I And I'm the opposite. I will, will not let myself touch it. I was just telling my sister... Uh, that's who I was on the phone with when you showed up. And I told her, I was like, yeah, man, I'm having, I think my new barber over tonight. And she's like, you're barber, but you do your own hair. And I said, I do my own head. My beard, I'm terrified that I would, I'd just go a little too deep and cause like a, you know, I'd take out a chunk and then I'd have to shave the whole thing down or I'd just be walking around looking like an idiot. So. Save it these, for me. I, I, no. Let me do it. I'm not doing it. I only trust myself with my head. Um. In looking through your Instagram, I found something I hadn't found on any of our prior guests yet, um, which was, I think you may have had a friend that passed away back in 2016, someone named Derek. Yeah. Do you remember that? Yeah. Um, he, I, I went to barber school with him, and we weren't super tight, but you go to barber school with somebody, we get lunch together, we helped each other through cuts, cut each other's hair. I remember him cutting my hair, and he cut his, and... I didn't know him super well, to be honest. Like, outside of school, I didn't really know him, but from what I understand, it seemed like he was battling some addiction and, um, and passed away through that. And that was kind of, uh, yeah, that was just, I remember being a somber moment in barber school. That was a long time ago. Yeah. Another guy that was closer with passed away as well shortly after I graduated barber school. A guy I started school with, um, his name was Junior, but he went by Mooney sometimes and we started at the same time so we were kind of on the same page he was a little further along because I think he had cut outside of school a bit but um, he was a good dude and he had a kid um, good kid I got to meet once and I remember we went to a Cubs game together the year before they won the World Series they went to uh, the playoffs and they got to the playing game with the Pirates and we skipped school to take the train down to Chicago together. And and um, we, we didn't actually go to Wrigley. We couldn't afford tickets, but we were just at the bars outside the stadium. We had such a good time, man. And we ended up missing the last train back. And uh, he knew, we kind of knew this guy that worked at the mall uh, that our school was in, like a store or two down. And he lived in the city somewhere. And, and Junior had his number. And he calls him up. This dude comes and picks us up from like, outside of Wrigleyville at midnight, drives us back to his place, and we sleep on this dude's floor next to us. He's got like a tiny one-bedroom apartment in Chicago. Sleep on his floor with no blankets. <laughs> um, and and that dude kept the AC on like 60. I was freezing my ass off. I don't think I really slept all night, but I, I just remembered uh, having that moment with him. And he was, uh, um, he'd been through some shit like, a lot of guys in that barber school had 
rehabilitated type. Um, been in and out of prison, but he was a really good dude. Like I got to know him, and he's a really good dude. He had a good heart, but he, uh, you know, sometimes you just raised in a certain situation that people can't get out of, and it was it was cool to be able to spend time with somebody that on the outside a lot of people are gonna look at and be like, mm, that dude's, I mean, you know, kind of. I think he's a gangbanger because I think he had been in and out of that life, you know, and he had a lot of tattoos. And um, But to be able to get to know him, be like, man, he's, he's a genuinely good dude. He cared about people. He's passionate about barbering. And to get to know him like that was cool. And, yeah, he passed away shortly after. And, and uh, I remember he gave me uh, a shave. Last time I was ever clean shaven, he had to pass Chapter 13 in the barbering book, which is the shaving chapter. And... Uh, you got to shave somebody. <laughs> and I sacrificed for him. I let him do it. And I, he hacked me up, too. <laughs> it was bad. <laughs> oh, no. Like, cut, cuts, you mean? Yeah. Not like, I wasn't, like, bloody all over, but little here little and there. Little And I remember I'm, like, leaning back in the chair. And he's finally wrapping up. And he hand, and he did this shit on purpose, too. He had two handfuls of aftershave. And, just, oh. and I, was, I remember I physically, like, jumped out of the chair. I was like, fuck. <laughs> What a and dick, Junior. I know it. <laughs> After he passed away, I, I swear he's going to be the last person to give me a shave. And he has been. Um, as you look back on, on you know, Junior and, and Derek, um, any advice that you'd give for someone as they're going through the grieving process? And part of the reason I wanted to ask is because it's funny, man. I was thinking about, this might be, you know, sound weird, but I was thinking about the fact the other day, like, we all die but we don't really talk about it that much almost like what we were talking about earlier with stretching like you know like why do we and i don't think i do not want to sit around <laughs> having hour-long conversations about death right that's that's not my intention and that's not what i think people do but also i think that junior is a, a, a good example um part of the reason i wanted to ask as well is because i have a friend who in 2021 his his brother passed away uh much too young in life 31 years old i believe possibly 32 and it hits you pretty hard and so the reason i wanted to ask if there's anything you'd share either regrets about how you'd grieve or did you you know was there something you did that was really good like go to counseling or i was more present with my family you know what advice would you give someone so we can try to give the listeners some tools so that when that day comes, you know, we've thought about it a little bit and maybe we have a, a strategy or two for how to go through that process. I think that talking to people that had a similar relationship with that person, sort of relate with them, tell stories, remember them in a positive way, is pretty powerful, but I also would definitely recommend therapy, counseling to everybody, even outside of grieving. Like, I think that's something everybody should do. and. I can't relate to a brother passing away. Like, that's, um, I can't imagine. Like, that'd be so hard for me. So I hope he's he's doing all right. And uh, um, I guess therapy would probably be my best recommendation. I heard, I'm kicking myself for not writing this down because I want to go and re-listen to it. But when I was on this podcasting binge during COVID, on one of them, they were talking about how particular Indian tribes, when they got back from war, the very first thing you would do is you would all gather around a fire and you would tell, tell all stories from the war that just happened, good and bad, brothers that had passed away, victories that were had. And the reason why is because it's instead of, instead of allowing their soldiers to isolate, to go back to their home and to be alone with those, those demons and those memories of like, fuck everyone I just killed you know there is a power to coming together as a community and talking about it and I I agree with you 100% man when you talked about you know talking to people close close to them I think that the one of the worst things you could do this is just me just David from 35 years on this planet and thinking about my experiences and things I've observed silence is probably the the worst thing right yeah. so whether it's a friend you know, if you can't afford a counselor, like you said, the next best person is probably just someone else that, that knew him, her, whoever the person was, you know, another friend, a brother, a sister, start talking through it. You gotta, you gotta let those things out. Because if you don't, you know, it'll grow into something a lot worse than it needs to be. Yeah. 
All right, I'm going to really switch gears here now. But thank you so much, man. We're, we're not quite wrapping up, but we are sort of getting away from mindset um, and barbering for a couple of minutes. I wanted to talk to you about your Instagram a little bit. You obviously are very consistent on it. Um, I'm curious, One, uh, two questions, really. Number one, you put a shit ton of hashtags on your post. And I wonder, um, do you have any idea if those help the posts get noticed? Do you even care if the posts get noticed? Is your Instagram for fun? Are you hoping it drives new business? Could you just talk to me a little bit about what your thoughts are and why you're so consistent behind it? Um, well, you know, that's one of the words that I put on that post we were talking about earlier, consistency, yeah. and I really believe in that. So there's a lot of times where I don't really feel like posting, but um, I love getting to look back. When I look back on old posts, I don't know if that was a post that I was happy about or just did it because, but I know that I was consistent and I like getting to look back and see the growth and see the progress. And I think there's a lot of value in that. I also know when I post a picture, I'm hypercritical of it. Hmm. And I've posted, I've posted plenty of pictures that I saw flaws in, and that was really hard for me to do. It still is, but I think it's important to do because like, that's part of being honest with yourself. And and I think a lot of barbers are scared to post a picture that they don't think is perfect because that's going out for everybody to see, and you don't want people to think you do bad work. And I understand that, but I believe in the work that's coming out of my chair. I always ask people what they think, so at the end of the day, I, I believe I've done my part, and if the haircut ain't perfect, none of them are, but at the end of the day, I, I want to post those because I look back, I'm critical, I can say, hey, you know what, next time I'm going to do this better, and I've done that so many times, I can think of with specific clients, you know what, I see this, I'm going to go about this next time differently, I'm going to do it this way, and, and it works, and I'll, I'll do it better, and now I've like kind of uh, perfected that cut a little more, right? But the hashtags are, uh, I just have them in a note, on my notepad, Instagram allows you up to 30 hashtags. And that's when people search. They, um, when someone types in Austin, Texas Barber, my post pops up because I have ATX Barber, Austin, Texas Barber, Austin Barber. Like every iteration of that I've thought of, I've tried to think of and put on a note and I post it so that I, that's just me trying to be more visible to people. I could care less about likes on it. Some of my posts have like two X on them. That's not why I post them. It's to, it's really for me to grow my business um, in terms of uh, visibility on Instagram and and to grow myself and being able to look back on those and say, hey, this is what I could do better next time. And I think that's like such, it's a free tool. It's free, totally free. Right. I, I think every barber should be using it. And I, I preach it to the guys and I've noticed some of them kind of have gone out and they use my uh my spots that i like to take my pictures at because i kind of figured out where the good lighting is they look good i appreciate it yeah it's gotten better over the years definitely and I'm, um yeah i'm proud of it and i'm proud of the overall body of work to be able to look back and say look, i got like 1200 haircuts i've posted on that each one of them is a, a memory i guess uh, got a little story to it and i'll be able to do that you definitely could tell it gets better because yeah. what I do when I'm researching someone, if they have an Instagram account, is I'll scroll to the very bottom because I want to sort of see what those early days look like um, and then work my way up. And I didn't, I, I can't, I wish I could tell you when I saw the change, but there is definitely somewhere like two, three, four hundred pictures in where you just saw it just started going, you know, whether it was a mixture of new barbershop, new phone. Who knows? But th by the time you get to the top of the page, um, as far as just like the quality of the pictures go, I think you got it dialed in pretty well. I want other barbers to be able to look at that that are starting out to say, hey, you know what? This guy's doing awesome work, but let's go back and we'll... It wasn't always that good, right? I, I'm grown. I can start where I am now. I want other barbers to be able to see that. I know it's not a lot of barber pages. Maybe they only post the best work and whatever, which is cool. There's nothing wrong with that. But um, I like the honesty of being like, hey, this is where I was. This is where I am now. Yeah. And it's funny, too, because you you even said we're mostly self-critical of ourselves. Other barbers might look at some of those cuts and say he could have done this, that, or the other. But I hope they do. But, but to me, I, 
I don't see any of that, but I also don't know what to look for, you know? Yeah. And I also wasn't looking at all the pictures. I was more looking, scrolling just to see if you typed anything or not, because I'm looking for things to pull questions from. Um, but yeah, I just, just to say if it makes you feel any better, I liked all of the pictures, but I'm also not a barber. <laughs> well, I appreciate it. No, I hope barbers do look at that and, and see that, and maybe that can make them better, or maybe they can say, hey, this guy's beard trim wasn't perfect. Here, I could see he could have done this better, but he's booked out for a month, and he's charging 30 bucks for a 15-minute beard trim. But that begs some questions, right? Like, I think so. <laughs> so in, in one way or another, I hope that people could see that and, and learn from it, grow from it, in the same way that I do. I did have a first uh, two days ago where someone actually reached out to me and um, asked if she could come on the podcast. And I said, sure. And I asked her how she found me. And uh, sure enough, she said it was one of the <coughs> it was one of the tags because I'm I'm in the exact same boat you are. If it gets one like or 500 likes, I don't I don't care. It's more about having a presence because um, I am still on the fence about if I'll ever build a website or not. Instagram, to your point, is free and requires almost no work except just consistently putting something on there every day. And the hope would be that eventually, if I had a certain percentage of people coming to me asking to be guests, that would be awesome because then I can put more time into editing or w whatever it is, right? It would just free up some of my time if I d didn't have to hunt down 100% of the guests. Um, so even my own hashtags, after hearing you say that, I'm going to play around with them a bit the next couple weeks and just see you know see if it changes anything yeah yeah and, and um i guess in my world when people reach out to me um i like that i like that they're reaching out to me but and it's probably different for me but i've got all my booking info right there on the page so it's like if you've gone as far to message me and see my work then you know i know you've seen the book in Right. Thing. It's right yep. there. So you didn't miss it. It's almost a red flag to me if someone's like reaching out to me to try to get a cut because I have sort of set my uh, my my boundaries. My the way I do things is right here. Yep. It says by appointment. Here's my link for the appointment. And this is how I do it. So I'll steer them in the right direction. I'll just say, hey, so man, I appreciate you reaching out. This is I do all my appointments right here at this website. And that's, that's about it. I like to keep it simple because I want people to that sit in my chair they gotta you know play by my rules and if a client's gonna be somebody that requires extra work every time to book their appointment for them and, and you know that's just not the kind of client tell them after but I will say that at the beginning of my career I had a lot more availability that I needed to fill so I would have I would have been more lenient with who was in my chair that's just kind of how it goes over time right you're not a class B barber anymore that's right it's funny because people I don't know if you asked about that but people ask about that Pretty frequently, the, the the license says Class A Parper, but there's no other class. <laughs> there's not. That's Wait, it. so what's the question they ask? What's a Class so, A? Yeah, barber? what's a Class A Barber? Like, is there other classes? There's that's every barber. If you've got your license, you're a Class A Barber. Okay, so it basically, just means sounds for cool. Anyone who doesn't know, yeah. including myself, you're just a licensed barber. Yeah, you're legit. Yeah, you went through some training. Hopefully. Actually, it doesn't mean that. <laughs> it doesn't mean that. It depends on the school from what we were talking about earlier. It depends on the school and it depends on the person more than anything because you can go through school and hide from cuts and get out of there without knowing what you're doing. I've seen people do it. Ooh. So that's on them. That's what always scares me, scared me a little bit about the personal training industry. Before I went to college, I looked into getting my personal training cert. And all you do is you order a book and you go and take a test. And if you pass that test, you get a piece of paper saying that you are allowed to get hired a gym and train anyone, whether it's a teenager playing hockey or a 75 year old who just fell down a flight of stairs and they're rehabbing, you are equally qualified to train either person. At the time, that didn't scare me. I just thought, woohoo, this will be super easy to do. And now looking back on it, it's like, that's our only standard. That's how yeah. we do. And, and I guess that sort of begs the question, like, should there be more standards? Do we want more, like, government involvement and in saying who could do what? Or Maybe not the government, but even or, just companies, like, I'm not going to remember what these acronyms stand for, but there's organizations like AFA and NASM. NASM stands for, like, the National Academy of Sports Medicine, I think. And this isn't a slam on them. Like, the personal training industry got to where it was for a reason. But if NASM was to even say maybe instead of one test, there's three. Or maybe we categorize the trainers. Maybe you have to be able to say, like, I want to work with, you know, um, sports 
people who are training for sports, great. You're going to take a specific type of certification. Um, I want to work with elderly people. Great. You're going to go through a completely different training that's going to solely focus on helping someone 65 and older live a healthy, productive life. You know, it just feels like it could be structured a little bit different because everyone is so different. And to give one certification and say, now you go work with the entire population seems problematic. Yeah, yeah. So so I guess it comes down, you got to do your research and, and, and really get to know somebody before you hire them, right? And I guess to relate it to the barbering world, like, Maybe you only do short hair or long hair, but regardless, you know, there's only one license. And, and Texas is actually going the opposite way with that. They just reduce the amount of hours it takes to get a barber's license. And I want to say they're actually getting rid of the cosmetology and barbering differentiation and turning it into a one license. Hmm. And almost every year there's somebody, I don't know who the hell is doing this, that is trying to get rid of barber licensing altogether, which is strange to me but somebody's trying to do it so if let's say that happened that would change essentially me david could say i want to go be a barber and i could just do it you could just do it you know <laughs> to me well the only thing that makes sense to me is it's like who's got the most money it's the big chains the franchise the sports clips great clips right they suck but there's a ton of them they make a lot of money so to me, it would make sense. They want to get rid of it so that they can get anybody in and say, "Hey, we got barbers," and they don't. They're mm -hmm. all they're all fresh, so they can start them at twenty five percent commission, and just get cuts out the door. That's all they care about, right? Yeah. As it stands now, though, they want to. Do you even consider them your competition? Because I've them never... absolutely not. Okay, because yeah, I was gonna say I've never ever thought. I need a beard trim. Where is there a great clips down the road I can go to? That's, some people just want what's the quickest, cheapest way I can make my hair shorter. So that's for them. That seems obviously terrifying. there's a ton of them, right? There's a ton. Of, every city's got a great clips and sports clips. So obviously they're doing something right. You know, there's a market they're hitting. I give them some credit where it's due, but I know for a fact they don't take care of their employees. So hmm. that's, um, it's not a great place to work. But to me, it would make sense that they're the ones that would want to get rid of licensure. Yeah, I could see that when you, the way you you uh, talked about it. Um, there is one particular client that when I read his handle, it made me uh, sit in here. It's right. cookies. <laughs> <laughs> How do you know I was going to say that? I'm Were you peeking at it. my notes? No, I, I just, no, as soon as you said that. <laughs> I don't remember. It was just like, thanks for coming in today or whatever. And as soon as I saw bitch cookies, I just started chuckling to myself. That's Josh. He's an awesome dude. I've been cutting him for probably six years now. He's a manager over at Doc Martens in the domain. Uh, just want to give him a little plug. It's, What's Doc awesome. Martens? I haven't been there it's, yet. Uh, uh, they do like shoes, boots. Oh, cool. Okay. Um, my uh, younger sister is into them. But anyways, yeah, I've been cutting it forever, and that's always been his handle. Uh, and it always cracked me up. Never said anything about it. it there's got you never asked him like, why bitch cookies? <laughs> Maybe I did the first time, but this would have been like five years ago. I was thinking right. he's like just cause fuck it. That's kind of how who he is. He'd be like, why not, dude? Bitch cookies. <laughs> Cracks me up though. It made me chuckle. It made my night. Um, all right, last couple of questions here. I found your wedding page. Yeah. So you went to, I always mispronounce their name, Abercrombie. 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 <laughs> Everyone knows what we're, what we're saying. The moose. What we're not saying. <laughs> um, you went in there to find some jeans, and you found this young lady, attractive or what... What interacted in this jean shopping? Uh, was she just pretty? Was it good conversation? What was it? Yeah, she, she was pretty. We didn't talk too much. Um, and and the full story is I needed to uh, get some work jeans because, uh, like I was saying, I worked at the Ruby Tuesday in my mall that my barber school was in. Forgot my work jeans. That was the, that was the uniform. You had to have, like, dark wash jeans and a, and a uh, button-up, whatever, a single-color button-up. And... Uh, Anyways, I forgot my jeans, so I had to go buy some real quick before work. And I go in there, and she helps me out. I think I ended up not even buying from them because they were too expensive, and I went over to, like, American Eagle to get a clearance rack pair. 
I want to say. But I just remember she helped me out. Um, I thought she was really attractive. And I wanted to ask for a number, but I didn't. And as I'm walking out, it's just like, <laughs> I'm walking out and I like look back and I was like, you're cute. <laughs> you said that? Yeah. <laughs> did she hear you? Yeah. And that was like, oh my God. Did like, she smile? Um, she did? I was like kind of walking away. I was like, she must have smiled, right? Like, yeah. Uh, but that was like the end of the interaction. And then like a couple weeks later was Black Friday. And I went back to Abercrombie with the intention of trying to find her in there, but posing as a shopper. And I was sort of like looking around to see if I could find her in there. Didn't find her, but I ended up like uh, picking up a shirt or whatever. And I go to check out, and then that's when I saw her. It was like super packed in there for Black Friday, right? And they've got like every register's going. There's like six of them. And the way they're doing it was just whoever's ready just says, next, next, next. And, go. and in my head, I'm waiting in line. And I was like, well, if I get her, I got to ask for her number. Yep. And sure enough, she calls me up. That's next. crazy. And I, and I asked her for her number. And she's like, well, I can't give you my number, but it's like policy or whatever, but um, you could give me yours. And in my head, I'm like, oh, man, that's a cop out. She doesn't want it. But but I gave it to her. And like later that night, um, she ended up texting me and went on our first date shortly after that. We just hit it off. That's a cool story, man. One of the, um, I read a book during COVID called The Power of Regret. You ever heard of that one by chance? Mm -hmm. Essentially, the reason I got it is because the author seemed reputable in the sense that they they surveyed interviewed i forget the word he used but thousands of people all over the globe because there's there's a study if i if i did a study of 50 guys as they went in and out of bearded barber texas that'd be wouldn't be the greatest data set right sure. yeah. <laughs> but they went all over the globe and it was just like a five question survey about regret and after they got everyone's top regrets they categorized them. And one of the biggest regrets was not acting on love. And so you, you, there you go. You know, you fall into that category. There's another one. Um, when you went back low, actually, let me backpedal a little bit. When you walk, were walking out of the store, do you remember if you were kicking yourself at all? Like, Definitely. And, Definitely. And why didn't you not just go back in that same day, do you think, since you knew she was working, you knew she was there? I had to get to work. Uh, I, don't, I don't know. I don't have a good... And excuse. I think sometimes we even find the excuses like, uh, I would, but all oh, my shift is starting. I don't think that's even know? what was on my head. I just think it's just like, dang it, didn't do it. Yeah. And it, that was it. That was and I think all of us, so many of me and my friends, I can think at times we found someone attractive. And why did we not say anything, whether it was asking for the number, saying your cue, whatever. When you went back for Black Friday, even though you had a really good reason to be in the store, did you still have like butterflies in your stomach or was it, so you were a little scared, but you acted on it. In an audience, there's like a whole crowd of people behind me waiting to get checked out. <laughs> and they must have heard, heard what I was saying to her. Or maybe they're not paying attention, but in my head, I'm like, man, there's all these people around and about to oh, yeah. for a number. You think everyone's listening. Super nervous. <laughs> yep. So now when you look back on that situa situation of, I literally met my wife by, you know, acting on this regret. Do you feel like since then, whether it's consciously or subconsciously, have you ever treated like real time decisions differently of like you see yourself saying something where normally you want it because you had that regret and like did, did, it, did it change the way you you've acted in real time in real like in situations if that makes sense yeah i was gonna say earlier like like current me would have gone back and i don't it's not i don't i wouldn't say it's necessarily because of that moment but i've just i feel like i've grown to a point where i really believe that um kind of like it's better late than never and once you're conscious of something you could have done better if it's right there do it like to me for me sometimes that's uh turn an awful light in the house that I walk past before I go to bed and it's like, hey, whatever, I'll leave it. No, I know I should go turn that light off. Go, I'm going to turn it off. Boom. Just like little things like that. Like, it's okay to not do it. But once you realize that that's what you would rather do, like that's what you want to do and it's right in front of you to do it, just go do it. So I think current me would have gone back in that moment and say, you know what, I wanted to get your number. Sure. Let me just go get it. Yeah. There's so many of us who, like, it's hard to say, like, oh, have I missed out on my significant other because of, because I didn't act. You know, in your case, you were in a really good situation because you knew where she worked. So you can just, you can go back and attempt to rectify the situation. 
And even if she wasn't there on Black Friday, you could have gone back again and been, oh, I'm shopping for Christmas for my brother or for Sean or, you know, mm-hmm. whoever. Um, so in your case, but if it's to like someone you met at a bar, at the barber shop, even the way I look at this podcast is I've tried to be better. I was at, um, got my teeth cleaned a couple weeks ago and the dental hygienist that cleaned them was the first person where she we had a really interesting conversation about gut health and just like things I never would have thought that your teeth affected. And so afterwards, I just I just asked the question. I was like, hey, I have this podcast. It's technically about business, fitness, and culture. Health falls under fitness. Would you want to come on and do like a tooth episode? And then we could talk about gut health and, and just see where it goes. And she said, yeah. And in that case, like the only way, for, I, I guess I could go back to and I could be like, uh, can I talk to a dental hygienist? But I'm glad I just ripped the bandaid off and was just like, yeah. Can you, will you just come be a guest on the show? You know, and I, I, I now look at those situations and realize that young me would have got super nervous and the worst case scenario would have been, she stabbed me in the mouth with a scallop, not a scallop, a scalpel, scalpel. Thank you. No worst case scenario. She's like, uh, no awkward schedule David with someone else in the six months when he comes back. That's worst case scenario. Yeah. Best case scenario. Dude, I got an awesome guest on. She's very articulate, very well spoken. She's coming on on the fifteenth. I can't wait to speak with her. I think it's going to be a great episode. And now I can live without regret because I just acted on it. So that's how I'm trying to go about my life more. It's just like those little moments where you have a quick decision to make and you have five seconds to decide, do I get up from the chair and leave the dental office or do I just ask her and see what she says? I'm trying to lean into that more of just just make the ask. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and how about that um, moment when the guy's next to you on the plane and you got that opportunity and it's like life just like throws these situations at you sometimes and you just got to be ready for them and that's kind of vague I guess but try to keep yourself I try to keep myself in good mental health and stay ready to um, take advantage of those situations because you're right sometimes you can't go back like I said it's better late than never and you could have gone back but maybe that conversation would have gone differently because it's a little more weird if you come back and say hey you know what Very I was thinking weird. we had a great conversation and maybe she doesn't say yes, you know. So, yeah, I try to. I try to be. Um, I think when you're like really living in the moment and being yourself, you can recognize these moments and, and take full advantage. And like, that's what that's what life's all about. Yeah. The overarching theme of the book that I mentioned, "The Power of Regret," is that it teaches us all a lesson. To we were talking about earlier, you sharpened your blade in that moment. You know, it was a, a lesson of like, man, should have just asked her for a number, and now. Hopefully someone else listens to this. Like, and they're like my buddy Jordan. He's 19. He's single. Maybe he'll hear this. And a couple months from now, he'll see someone he finds attractive and go just ask, you know, yeah. and learn from your regrets. So I love that the book took that perspective. And we were talking about that earlier, too, of looking at your regrets and how they're they're powerful. They're not mistakes. Don't, don't you know, mentally whiplash yourself over these things. Like, learn from it. Live more in the moment. And just take those as, as little life lessons that are coming your way. Yeah. I think I really believe that nothing has to be a regret if you learn from it. If you can look back and say, this was my mistake and look at how I've done better, like, that's awesome. Now you get to look back on that moment in a positive light. Yeah. Last question for you. I think you should rebrand your Instagram page as some sort of like Phil Winfrey dating pool. <laughs> I'm not being serious. But as I was looking through it, if there's any local ladies or guys, anyone that finds men attractive in Austin, you should check out where did I write? Faded underscore by underscore Phil. Faded by Phil. There's just pictures and pictures of handsome men. But then I was wondering, are they handsome because they're in Austin or are they handsome because they just got faded by Phil? I don't know. I like to think I got maybe they stuff. were ugly before. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm kidding. I mean, that was so mean. <laughs> you seen that picture of me that you showed? I did. You were looking rough, buddy. Yeah, that's that, that's the difference between getting a date and not for sure. <laughs> maybe you should just take that one, put that at the top. But no, I love your before and afters, man. Those were so good, even for the guys that weren't necessarily looking 
rough like you were the the before and afters were just super fun so i really did enjoy thumbing through your page for however long i did yeah maybe i can just put a little uh on every post just to have a either single or taken box and just x so that people can know that's what i'm saying yes there you go you could use like the green check if they're if they're single like green check means okay good to go go ahead and message them or if it's like the the red circle with the line there it's like no nah, this one's and then how do i monetize this service yeah you know, every time someone clicks on, maybe they have to click to unlock if there's a check or a block. And every time they click, you get a, you know, a dollar. Or yeah. Whatever. You do something with that. Um, I think there's something to that. We, we, that's, I, I've said it in the shop plenty of times. Like, um, the only reason we have a job is because of significant others. You know, if, if you didn't have anybody you were trying to look good for, you're not going to the barber. Kind of like over COVID. We weren't trying to look good for anybody. We didn't do shit with our hair. Yeah. So. I'm not thinking about, since I started filming this, I'm thinking about it. I don't think you're ever going to catch me recording an episode. And and I'm not slamming on jeans and t-shirts, but like I like to carry myself in a certain way. And I, you know, I don't want to look like a schmuck on this thing. Yeah. So I'll probably start getting the beard trimmed a little bit more frequently and might even start shaving the head twice a week instead of once a week. But I don't know. I think there's a... There is like a confidence to it, mm-hmm. you know, I, even if it's, it's, I don't even want the person on the other end of the camera to find me attractive or anything like that. It's more of like, if I'm putting my image out there, uh, image is I so just important. want to, I want myself to look good. I don't know. Is that yeah. bad? No, no. I think it's like really valuable. It's something that I recently um, started taking a lot more seriously, the way I dress in the barbershop, um, because I'm the manager of that shop. I run that shop, I want people to be able to look at me and like, I don't think it's subconscious, you know, but people see what you have on and like they create an image in their head of who you are based on their first, uh, what, their first interaction with you. Who is this guy? Oh, he's got nice shoes on and nice pants and nice shirt. Okay. He takes himself seriously. And then you have every chance to really prove who you actually are. But the first impression is really important. I really believe that. And it also goes into the way you see yourself when you're looking good and you got a nice beard trim and you're dressed nice. I think, yeah, there's a lot of power to that. Yeah. I chose you because you had a beard. That's that's a good reason. <laughs> that's your, a lot of people who's, do. Who's your, your um, I feel so bad. I didn't write down his name. Who's your coworker? The one that was 16 when you met him? Jordan. Jordan. Yeah, I looked at his picture and I was like, nah. <laughs> and Jordan, if you ever listen to this, no offense to you, but like, I want it. It's like the whole reason I told the story earlier that I liked the guy in the suit. I was like, oh, I would dress like that. Plus, you're bald and I don't see any blood. So you must be decent at your job. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I will say just as a record, Jordan does do a mean beard trim. He's, does he? He is good. Yeah, did he get yours in that before and after picture I showed you? I did mine on that one. Oh, that's right. You mentioned always... that. You only you touch the. Yeah. You wouldn't let someone else. I'll let Jordan uh, do some lines, but whenever. Would you let me? If I were to do a. But yeah, but you know, it's just too too important for my uh, for my uh, image, for my shop brand. You know, bearded barber. I gotta have a solid beard. I can't risk it. It would be a strange barber shop if it was called the Bearded Barber and Toby everyone a was a hundred percent clean shaven, like no mustaches, no no nothing. Just That's like a red all flag. these clean shaven kids, not kids, men. You know, bearded barber. Yeah, we can do beards. Come on in. Yeah, we're a class A barber. We're a class B barbers. B for beard. Well. On that same note, I guess great clips is a little misleading, right? This is true. They're not doing great work. <laughs> <laughs> but, but people go to them. Yeah, people go. You know, the, like you said, it's they are they are reaching the demographic of cheap, fast. If that's your priority, yeah. this is not cheap and this is not fast. I want this. I when you were done, I felt more confident. I felt I was happy. I looked at it and I was like. Fuck yeah. I don't think I would say fuck yeah if I went to Great Clips. <laughs> You'd be like, fuck. <laughs> exactly. What did I do? Yeah. <laughs> Just pay a bill to 30 bucks and stop being a cheap ass already. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's, that's, it's cool that you get to do that. I get to do that for people in 15, 30, 45 minutes. Like, it can really change the way that you look at yourself. I love that. I get to do that. Yeah, it's cool. Yeah. Phil. Thank you so much, man, for coming on. I really appreciate Thank it, dude. You, dude. Yep. Appreciate you, man. If you live in Austin and you need 
You said it earlier, but you do haircut, shampoo, beards, anything from the neck up that you need done that relates to hair, essentially. Jordan does the shoulders down. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Jordan does the shoulders down. Um, to book with Jordan or with Phil or any of the other barbers at the Bearded Barber, just go to beardedbarberatx.com. Or you can find Phil if you want him specifically. He's on Instagram. There's a link to book there as well. Don't slide into his DMs, guys. He talked about that. That's a red flag. That's how you don't get Phil. That's how you get Jordan. He passes <laughs> you over to his inbox. Um, this has been really good. Everyone, if you liked this episode, please like it, subscribe to it, leave a review, share it with your friends, take a couple seconds of your day to give us some love. If you really, really love the show and you want to throw some money our way, go to patreon.com slash sitbackwithdavid. And if you happen to live in Austin or you're going to be traveling to Austin and you want to be a guest on the show, either slide into the DMs on Instagram or you can email sitbackwithdavid at yahoo.com. Phil, you have been Phil. I have been David. This has been an excellent conversation, and I hope that everyone has a healthy and happy Saturday night. Oh, yeah. Bye, everyone.